I'd like to call to order the Committee of the Whole of Council for Monday, May 15, 2023. For the call to order, I'll read the land acknowledgement. For more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and many others who were families, friends, and communities the way we are today. The Town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818 and the relationship it establishes with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history and the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community. We seek to continue empowering expressions of pride amongst all of the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better and to continue to recognize, learn, and grow in friendship and community nation to nation. Can I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the agenda, please? Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Houston. Mm. Uh, any amendments or comments on the agenda? All those in favor, that's unanimous, thank you. And now I'm going to turn this over to Clerk Almas. We're going to have an election of the Chair and Vice Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Certainly, thank you, Your Worship. In accordance with our new governance structure that we're piloting for the next few months, we do provide the opportunity for a Chair and Vice Chair to be nominated uh, that may be the same or different than the Mayor uh, and the Deputy Mayor uh, as their roles are for Council. So we have circulated uh, a request for any council interest, and we do have three members of council that have expressed their interest at this time. Uh, that is Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Baines, and Councillor Doherty. I'm going to start with the nominations for the position of chair. So if there's any further nominations for the position of chair. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Clerk Thomas. Um, from the outset of our consideration of moving to Committee of the Whole, uh, my thoughts have always uh, had been for continued, con continued, continuity <laughs> reasons and in recognition of the Mayor as head of council and as outlined in uh, the procedural bylaw that the Mayor preside over matters of council. Um, during this initial period of change, it would be most appropriate to maintain the normal chair protocol. Um, my position hasn't changed as to that. Um, Mayor Hamlin, in my opinion, should continue to chair the position. Um, an additional factor in support of this is that the mayor's position is now established to be a full-time position, and I think there's a learning curve to that as well. So um, I would like to nominate Mayor Hamlin for the position of chair. Thank you. Is there any further nominations for the position of chair? Once... Going twice. All right, I will ask all the nominees if they would let their name stand. Firstly, Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Baines. Yes. Councillor Doherty. Yes. And Mayor Hamlin. Uh, well, no. <laughs> but I do appreciate the kind words said by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, but I think that, you know, we've sort of uh, evolved to the position of a committee of a whole with a chair uh, that I think should be someone other than the mayor. This is a temporary, um, we're going to review this and see how it's going in the fall. And so let's uh, change it over now and then we can see what, if we want to switch it up at all again in the fall. So, but thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. So we will be proceeding with the three nominations. I will be doing them in the order that they were received and we'll be providing each of the candidates an opportunity of up to a maximum of two minutes that you may use or you may forfeit should you choose to, to explain to your uh, council colleagues on why you would like to seek the position of chair of the committee, the whole. And I'll start with Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clerk Almas, and uh, to my council colleagues. I've uh, long been a proponent of the development of all council members and their ability to chair meetings right back to when we were developing the terms of reference for the previous committee structure. And uh, I'm offering myself up early in the rotation because I, I think I see a benefit to having uh, continuing with yet another style of leadership in, in sharing the meetings for the newer members to be able to take on board uh, before their opportunity. So I would just ask for your support, and I would love to be uh, in the rotation early. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Baines. Thank you, Clerk Almas. <clears throat> I'm uh, applying for this because I believe in process, and I believed in that essentially all of my adult life, um, a fair, transparent, and inclusive process to all parties. 
I look at this role as sort of being, um, quite frankly, sort of master of ceremonies in the sense that your job is to make sure that all the people presenting to council, whom, some of whom may be very nervous and inexperienced, feel comfortable and that you are able to elicit from them, from them um, the real points that they wish to make to council. I've done that as a chair for uh, many different organizations and as a master of ceremonies uh, in different venues, but more particularly for 23 years as a mediator, uh, it is my job, the paid job, to, in, to try and elicit, particularly from those parties who may be uncomfortable presenting in public, uh, the important parts they really want to get through. Having said that, I'm um, in awe of my two colleagues here who have great experience at council, and uh, whatever your, the outcome is, I'm quite supportive of it, but I thought I'd present an opportunity for other councillors to see um, different perspectives, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baines and Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid I sound like a me too to <laughs> Councillor Jeffrey, um, but uh, I am a four-term member of council. Uh, and I'm one of only three members of this council with uh, recent council experience. So I felt that it was very important for me to demonstrate a desire and a willingness to leave this, lead this council and to share my experience with this council. Um, in addition, I can offer that I have sat as chair and as vice chair on both the uh, corporate and community services and the development and operations standing committees uh, during the previous term of council. Um, uh, but I will also echo Councillor Baines's words that uh, makes no matter uh, the best one shall prevail and we will all continue to work happily together just as we have been so far. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. So we will proceed to our election and members uh, are able to choose, uh, vote for themselves uh, for the uh, appointments to the two positions. If there is a tie uh, <laughs> for elimination purposes, um, it, because in a vote to select the member is by a majority vote. So if we don't get the majority um, off the bat and there is a tie, then there is um, a process for uh, elimination of the tie as well as if there is a tie for, but we won't have that today because we have our nine members. So we do have odd numbers. So we won't have a tie for the final uh, choice. So at this point, I will start, uh, I will call them in the order of the nominations that were received. So first of all, those wishing to uh, support uh, Councillor Jeffrey for the position of chair, please raise your hand. Our majority right off the bat. <laughs> so that was simple. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so at this point, I'll open up the nominations for the position of vice chair. Those interested in the position of vice chair, uh, now is the time to provide your nomination. Councillor Baines for the position of vice chair. Oh. Yeah. Lori? Yes. Your interest from around the table for the position of vice chair going once going twice okay and at this point uh, you have the ability to provide again for the position of vice chair up to uh, two minutes to uh, express to the group why you would uh, hope your colleagues consider you for the position of vice chair uh, I know that we do have two that have already presented so you're welcome to represent as well uh, or forfeit your opportunity so at this point I'll open it up to Councillor Baines uh, thank you all forfeit thank you Council Deputy Mayor Fryer Thank you, and I will speak uh, as I, I hadn't put my name for for chair, and that was because I had uh, nominated the the mayor. Um, I do believe that uh, continuity is important in in uh, in moving forward, and I have been um, chairing in the absence of uh, of Mayor Hamlin you know, during this short period of time. Additionally, when I was on previous council, I had uh, served terms as the as the chair of the subcommittees as as well. 
Um, in addition, I uh, have sat for nine years on the um, uh, Center Wellington Hydro Board, of which I was the chair of the Audit and Finance Committee. So I do have experience in chairing the meetings, and I, I will put my name forward to uh, to um, sit as vice chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayor Fryer and Councillor Doherty. All four of it. Thank you. Perfect. And again, the same rules apply as we move forward for the uh, selection of the position of vice chair. I'll call an order of nominations received. First one, all those in favor of Councillor Baines as vice chair, please raise your yes cards. Thank you. All those in favor of Deputy Mayor Fryer for the position of vice chair. One. And for the uh, Councillor Doherty. Four. Right, so we do not have a majority vote to begin with. So by process of elimination, we'll proceed with uh, Councillor Baines and Councillor Doherty. So again, everybody restarts and you have new uh, votes. Uh, though all those in favor of Councillor Baines, please raise your yes cards. And all those in favor of Councillor Doherty. Thank you. And Councillor Doherty is your vice chair. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll just take a brief moment here while we. I just wanted to say I, I wasn't clear. I thought that two members had withdrawn. So I was trying to what? figure out how we were going into voting. So. Uh, Perfect to speak. Ah. Okay. I did yeah. not to interrupt, but that's the impression I had as well. Okay. Good. Our, it's okay. We, we can do. We no, can no, do no, no. Re -vote. Good, good. good. I, well, I think we should re vote, shouldn't we? I think. Uh, yeah, that. Well, it's an easy thing to do. <laughs> to restart. We can redo the votes, just to be clear. Yeah. Certainly. All right. So they were just forfeiting, uh, not the position uh, to remain and keep their names in the hat. It was to provide a speech to their colleagues. All right. So we'll uh, start again with Councillor Baines. All those in favor of Councillor Baines? You. Uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer. One. And Councillor Doherty. Doherty has received majority votes. Our vice chair for uh, our, the remainder of our pilot project. Okay, congratulations to you both. And I will move to Ca Councillor Jeffrey C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get stuff all over. Oh. I've already packed up. <laughs> 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 All right, so thank you everyone. So um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. So the clerk has advised what we will do is, first of all, we'll go right to declarations of uh, pecuniary interest. Firstly, is there anyone wishing to declare? Uh, Councilor Potts. Thanks, Chair Jeffrey. Um, I just want to make reference to 8.2 uh, when it speaks to the BIA and food truck licensing. It'll be perceived in the community that my family business is food trucks. However, this is a complete different line of work uh, from what we operate. So I just wanted to be transparent that uh, I do not feel that I'm in conflict. Okay. Thanks. That's great. Thank you for uh, stipulating that. Are there any other declarations for this evening? And if not, we know that we can bring it up at any time if we feel we're in that position. Okay. Thank you. So uh, with that, our deputants were advised that... Um,
uh, they would be beginning around five o'clock. So what we're going to do is move right into staff reports, item number uh, six. And the first uh, there is 6.1 uh, C2023-15, short-term accommodation uh, licensing framework uh, draft number one. And I believe I'm turning it over to Clerk Almas uh, to kick us off. Certainly, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Jeffrey. And uh, I don't have very much to add. Uh, we have our licensing and compliance officer that's going to be presenting uh, to the committee the whole, the follow-up report based on council support uh, in, I believe it was the end of February, uh, maybe the beginning of March to get us here to our next steps. So I'll put it over to uh, Ms. Phone. Good afternoon, Chair and members of committee, and congratulations on your um, new election. Um, next slide, please. So the purpose of today's presentation uh, is to report back to committee with the draft short-term accommodation licensing bylaw and framework, and to seek approval uh, for staff to prepare and initiate a public consultation on the draft framework. Next slide, please. As you are aware, the definition of short-term accommodations is set out in the town zoning bylaw, um, but in short, it means the rental of 30 days or less, and it is currently not permitted in Collingwood apart from bed and breakfast establishments. Um, just, but despite this ban, there are approximately 375 um, STAs operating in Collingwood currently. And since 2018, um, the Bylaw Services Division has received um, increasing complaints about homes being used as STAs with 320 calls for service. Next slide, please. Uh, these next two slides highlight some of the work to date, uh, which I won't spend too much time on other than to highlight some general milestones so far in the review. Um, in June 2022, staff presented a report to council with research and sought approval to obtain public feedback on short-term accommodations in Collingwood. Next slide, please. The public consultation then followed in the summer, and this feedback um, was analyzed and informed the recommended approach that was presented to Council in February of this year. And since then, staff have been developing the la uh, draft licensing program based on uh, this direction from Council. Next slide, please. And in developing the recommended approach, um, staff identified six criteria based on the feedback from the public consultation and an, an analysis of municipal best practices. Um, again, I won't spend too much time on this slide um, other than to remind everyone of the criteria as I re will refer to this um, back later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, as I've mentioned in previous presentations on this topic, there does not currently exist any provincial legislation or regulations on short-term accommodations in Ontario. Um, however, using the tools through the Municipal Act and Planning Act, Collingwood can construct a program that reflects the local goals and objectives for managing short-term accommodations. Under the Planning and Municipal Acts, there are limits as to uh, the regulations and prohibitions that may be imposed. Um, and as such, the licensing bylaw uh, will contain most of the requirements on short-term accommodations. Um, but amendments to the official uh, plan and the zoning bylaw are, are also necessary to align the overall draft framework. Um, but today's focus will be mainly on the two items in blue, uh, the draft licensing bylaw and the proposed zoning bylaw changes, um, which if approved by council um, will be subject to public consultation over the summer. Next slide, please. So first I will discuss the draft, draft licensing bylaw. And this slide gives a bit of an overview of all of the sections in the bylaw. And I will highlight some of the specific requirements in the licensing bylaw, um, but I first wanted to explain kind of the structure of the overall draft bylaw. The first few sections are a little bit more administrative in nature and include definitions and the title. Um, the section four sets out the general rules and uh, for residents who are interested in marketing, providing, or operating a short-term accommodation within Collingwood. Section 5 identifies the terms of the license and the associated timing for that. 
Section six outlines the three licensing classes. Section seven contains the ap application requirements for a new license or a license renewal, which are broken into um, specific application requirements outlining what needs to be submitted to the town. Um, site requirements pertaining to the site of the short-term accommodation, as well as some inspection um, requirements. In the event that a license is, uh, application is refused or a license is revoked, terminated, or suspended, um, Section 8 outlines the details around that, and Section 9 explains the right to appeal and the process for the hearings. Um, sections 10 to 14 explain uh, the enforcement provisions around entry and inspections, orders, penalties, and the demerit point system. Um, the bylaw also contains four schedules, which are the renter's code of conduct that must be signed by each renter, a licensee code of conduct and acknowledgement form, and a responsible person consent form where that must be submitted along with um, the application to the town. And details on the demerit point system, including the table of the offenses and the associated points. Next slide, please. The proposed bylaw requires all individuals looking to market, provide, or operate a short-term accommodation to obtain a license from the town. Licenses are not transferable or shareable between owners, and they are valid for one year, after which they must be renewed to remain in operation. The licensee must ensure that all listings of the STA are clearly, or sorry, the license, licensing number are clearly set forth um, in the listing and that the maximum number of occupants is also identified in the listing. To obtain a license, individuals are required to complete and submit an application form with supporting documents such as a site and floor plan, proof of principal residency, a signed declaration stating that the premises is used primarily for residential purposes, proof of insurance, and they must pay applicable licensing fees. Um, to distinguish between the various types of short-term accommodations, three licensing classes are proposed. Class A is the rental of guest rooms in a principal residence, so tip, uh, traditionally kind of the typical bed and breakfast like we currently have operating. Um, class B is the rental of the entire principal residence, and Class C is the rental of an accessory dwelling unit. And each licensing class has specific criteria that must be met. Uh, we are also proposing a one license rule, uh, meaning the individual can only obtain one license per, and there is a limit of one per property, with a maximum cap of 200 licenses. Next slide, please. The bylaw limits the maximum number of occupants to two persons per guest room and a maximum of four guest rooms and eight guests. It sets a number of a maximum number of days a dwelling unit can be rented for class B and class C licenses to 180 days. Any resident applying for a new license or renewing a, an existing license must also ensure that the uh, short-term accommodation is operating in compliance with all applicable laws, such as the Ontario Building Code, the Ontario uh, Fire Protection and Prevention Act, and the Electrical Safety Code. Um, for example, as part of the application process, an in inspection uh, from the fire department will be required to confirm if the dwelling is operating in accordance with provisions of the fire code. And after that, uh, a mandatory fire inspection will be required at least every two years. Uh, the applicant must also provide the name and contact uh, information of a person who can be readily contacted and uh, respond to the property within 60 minutes. Um, as I noted uh, before, um, the bylaw also sets out a number of enforcement measures, um, including the authority for the uh, licensing officers to suspend or revoke a license and the process for an appeal to a committee. Um, provisions relating to administrative monetary penalties system are also included in the drafts for public comment as staff are exploring the implementation of such a system for the short-term accommodation licensing as well as other bylaws um, and lastly with the application process the bylaw also requires the payment of licensing fees which will be set out in the fees and service charges bylaw 
Um, and as committee is aware, just as a note, staff in economic development are also concurrently just um, exploring the implementation of a municipal accommodation tax, which from my understanding, a uh, report will be coming forward in the fall. Um, next slide, please. The proposed zoning changes include removing existing uh, bed and breakfast uh, provisions, amending the definition of short-term accommodation to clarify that short-term accommodations are a home occupation and include bed and breakfast as part of the definition of short-term accommodation. Um, permit STAs within single detached dwellings or a second unit and reinforce the limit of one short-term accommodation per lot. For parking, in addition to the spaces required for the primary dwelling unit, the proposal is one space per guest room where there are two or fewer guest rooms and a minimum of two parking spaces where there are three or four guest rooms. Next slide, please. And this slide uh, highlights the anticipated outcomes of the proposed licensing program as it relates to the goals um, identified for managing short-term accommodations. Generally, the licensing bylaw will provide the town with the tools to better manage short-term accommodations while aiming to encourage their peaceful coexistence within Collingwood's neighbors, neighborhoods, protect long-term rental and housing options, ensure safety for STA guests, and maintain the benefits that STAs bring to homeowners and businesses in the community. Next slide, please. As I noted, staff are seeking approval from committee to conduct consultation this summer on the draft licensing bylaw and the proposed zoning amendment. Following that, staff will analyze the feedback received and prepare a staff report that summarizes the feedback and any <laughs> updates to the bylaws and, as, and the zoning amendment. The report will also seek approval from council to proceed with the licensing bylaw and a formally structured zoning bylaw amendment. And next slide, please. Thank you for your attention today. I would now like to open the floor for questions. Actually, sorry, I forgot to. I We did receive a couple of questions from a member of the committee this morning that I would also just like to read out and uh, the, the answers as well provided by staff, if that's okay. Please. Yes, please Thank you. Um, so the first question, I was surprised to see that only principal residents and family dwellings, single family dwellings, would be considered. What about secondary residences? Many of our resort area condo owners use their condos only in one season and would be interested in renting them at, at other times. What about townhomes and other housing forms? This is staff's reply. Based on Council's direction in February 2023, staff have prepared the draft short-term accommodation licensing framework proposed in, in the previous staff report, Regulatory Options for Short-Term Accommodations. The principal residence approach allows residents to use their home to generate income, such as to offset the cost of living or housing, but aims to limit owners from converting possible long-term rental housing opportunities to short-term accommodations due to the financial incentives of renting short-term and prevent individuals from buying homes to turn them into pseudo-hotels. The principal residence ap approach also assists in ensuring that the subject properties are used residentially in accordance with the town zoning bylaw and not as standalone commercial enterprises without any residential component. The draft zoning provisions currently set out that an STA may be located in either a single detached dwelling as this is consistent with the town's current provisions for bed and breakfast. However, it is staff's intent to include this as matter as a matter in part of the upcoming public consultation to better understand the community's thoughts and opinions around whether to permit STAs in other types of dwellings. And the second question posed was, under enforcement considerations, it is noted that bylaw would monitor for non-compliant properties. Will this be proactive, i.e. through regular surveying of STA platforms or reactively by complaint, uh, complaint only. And staff's response. Under the proposed STA licensing program, enforcement will be a combination of proactive and reactive approaches based on the expanded enforcement tools provided through licensing. For example, the town will take a proactive approach to ensure that all residents looking to operate an STA have obtained a license from the town 
Following implementation, the town will be able to proactively monitor advertisements to ensure that all listings contain a license number and set out the approved uh, occupancy limits. In addition, there will be ongoing monitoring of listings and licensed STAs to ensure that they comply with the bylaw requirements. Issues such as noise, parking, and garbage will continue to be addressed on a reactive basis given the nature of these incidents. However, the licensing bylaw allows the town to apply demerit points on an individual's license if they are found in violation of an applicable law. If the licensee accumulates enough demerit points, their violation may be suspended, or sorry, their license may be suspended or revoked. And that is all I have for today. I will now open the floor for questions. Thank that you. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Fone. So first of all, we're going to go to the public and I will ask the clerk, I'm not seeing anyone in the gallery indicating they wish to speak to us at this point. So uh, Clerk Almas. Certainly, uh, thank you, Chair Jeffrey. We do have a couple attendees participating remotely. If you would wish to address the committee of the whole regarding this presentation on short-term accommodations, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. No interest at this time. Okay, terrific. All right, so we'll first uh, put the motion on the floor and then I'll ask uh, committee members to uh, to give comment or ask questions. So uh, the motion is that staff report C2023-15 short-term accommodation licensing framework draft number one be received and that council direct staff to proceed with a public consultation with respect to the attached draft short-term accommodation licensing bylaw and proposed zoning bylaw changes and corresponding source requirements as summarized in this report and further that staff be directed report back to council no later than October 2023 with an analysis of feedback, any updates to the draft bylaws, and a detailed implement implementation plan outlining staffing and licensing fees. Uh, so I have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Baines and Councillor Houston. All right, so questions. So I've seen <coughs> Councillor Potts and I saw Councillor Perry, and we'll go on from there. Thanks, uh, Chair Jeffrey. Uh, two questions. And I, uh, forgive me if maybe they've been covered. Um, so in my first question, so like now when there's an, an ad, um, you know, for a short-term accommodation and bylaw obviously can't enforce, it's, it's hard to determine if it is an operating um, Airbnb or STA. Under the new policy, if there is a property that's advertising that potentially only uses inside photos um, and you can't determine what property it is, what changes in trying to enforce it to, to to prohibit the premises or or, um, or what, whatever, you, you understand what I mean? Okay, and I'll, I'll just and number two, part of the annual renewal, will the surrounding residents be part of the process to comment potentially on the previous year's experience? Um, if you get a, you may one year have a really great experience, um, or you have some new residents come in and it was a bad experience, and you get some new homeowners on the street. If if, if public input or the surrounding areas input. It may be uh, good for like a renewal. Um, so those are my two questions. Thanks. Okay, that's great. So as this is a platform to go to public, we don't need the answers tonight. We're just yeah. gonna put what our questions yeah. are. Great, okay, Councillor Perry. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, what would be the definition of a responsible person? In, in I, Kind of got to know that. Okay. All right. So okay. we'll I, have, I have a couple questions, but I'll let you get to that one first. I, th I think tonight, what, unless staff are prepared to answer, I think what we're going to do is take the questions ahead okay. of time. We're going to have a lot of process going forward once we hear the public also. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Um, the other question was de de demerit points. Um, what's going to be a total demerit points if you get so many against you? Or do you earn points or do you lose points? Um, that's a question. Uh, the other one was, um, has there been any thought as minimum spacing between the units as I, I'd kind of like to see a minimum distance between the two. And the last one is a, is a comment more than anything. I, I'd rather that we didn't have to deal with this, but it's not going away like e-bikes and things like that. They're not disappearing. It's something that we have to learn to live with. So my comment is um, it, it's more like 
I think this is a great initiative, and uh, it's more the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Um, we we kind of have to deal with it, and I think this is a fantastic way to, to go about it. So that, those are all my comments for now. Um, Ms. Fong, were there any in there, quick ones that you wanted to answer uh, at this time that you can? Uh, through Please, you. I'll give you that opportunity with everyone. If there's something quick you can knock off your list, go right ahead. Through you, okay. Chair. Through you, Ms. Chair. Um, the licensing bylaw does define um, responsible person, which I can read the definition right here it means the owner or, or agent assigned by the owner or licensee to ensure the short-term accommodation is operated in accordance with the provisions of this bylaw the license and other applicable laws um, and the specific requirement is that they have to respond to the uh, con being contacted by the town within 30 minutes and respond to the actual uh, premises within 60 minutes um, and I'm Blanking on the other question, and I know it was a very easy, quick answer. Distance. Um, distance. distance. Um, yes, that is something that we will be actually including as part of the upcoming public consultation. Um, that is uh, something that some municipalities have implemented to deal with density issues, um, specifically where there's been clustering of short-term accommodations. Right. Um, so whether or not if we include it up front, that's definitely something we could even examine after implementation if we have a particular an issue where we have um, a cluster of STAs. But um, the, for example, the the dwelling units, since uh, that might be up come as part of the upcoming public consultation, um, that also might impact into, for example, the density um, and distance requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, new questions, Councillor Baines. Actually, I think Councillor Ring was before. Oh, was it? Okay, sir, Councillor Ring. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, through you to uh, the question that I have, and, and you've and you've answered it, uh, and I know it's just it's just still a gray area with me. Is uh, um, you were saying that with the and I understand when uh, Councillor Perry asked about the responsible, who's responsible. So we're going to have to when somebody makes application for a license, and if it's awarded, they uh, would also have to have a second person listed as responsible. The only reason I'm asking that is because we've got to give, in the bylaw you you've explained that you can be a you you can rent out your res your personal residence for up to 80, 180 days if you're out of if you're if you're away. So I'm just wondering if you're away, how are you going to get there within sixty minutes? That's my question. <laughs> yeah. Through your, chair. Um, through your chair. So as part of the uh, bylaw, Schedule C is the responsible person form, which will be required to be submitted as part of the application by the owner. The owner can be the responsible person, um, but the requirement is that they need to be on site within 60 minutes of being contacted by the town. So if, if it's an owner renting out their principal residence, they don't think they're going to be able to comply with that requirement. They will need to appoint somebody to be responding to the the ta like to comply with that requirement in the bylaw or else they will potentially you know be awarded demerit points um or they would be found in non-compliance with the provision of the bylaw and i actually remembered uh, my answer to a previous question i just wanted to note about the demerit points um we do have in the license currently a proposed in the draft bylaw that seven demerit points, for example, um, an accumulation of total seven demerit points would result in a potential suspension. An accumulation of 15 demerit points would potentially result in a, a, the revocation of a license. Thank you. Could I just have a follow-up yes, question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I originally, when this first come up a few meetings ago, um, I think I... <clears throat> At the time, I personally would be against any short-term accommodations if it's going to take away from long-term accommodations, affordable housing, and that that's... Uh, but I can see now, and I think that you probably explained it, but I just want to make sure um, the, the idea of the licensing is to uh, ha have be able to enforce um, some type of uh, legislation or penalty for the illegals, right? And, and I'm just wondering if, if that's the biggest, I, I, I guess um, they're not going to go away. I mean, I don't, it, we, we, we know that there's 350 illegal STAs running within the boundaries of Collingwood. And uh, we're going to put a cap at 200 and, and hopefully we can um, um, be able to uh, 
um, make sure that everybody everybody's on board. And that, that's the main reason for the license is is to have some type of a control. Is that correct? Go ahead. For you, Chair, and, and and this does kind of touch on Councillor Potts' question earlier as well. Um, with the licensing, it does allow us to uh, focus our attention on those problematic properties or unlicensed properties. Um, once we have the information, like we don't have any information, for example, on bed and breakfasts currently operating in town. We don't collect like their locations. So once we have a program implemented and we have those uh, STAs that are permitted to operate licensed, we can turn our attention and focus to those listings and properties that are are not licensed, are not complying. Okay, so we're going to have Councillor Baines and Councillor Houston and then Councillor Doherty. So, Councillor Baines, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Jeffrey. To Compliance Officer Phone, actually just following up on that point, um, this is about numbers and clarification mm -hmm. of the numbers. If we're capped at 200 STAs, some of those would be the existing B&Bs in town? And you, do you have any idea on how many of those are? Through you, Chair. Um, so those numbers would are captured in the 375 that we are approximately estimating now as bed and breakfast are a form of short-term accommodation. Okay. So um, uh, no further follow-up. And thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Houston. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Baines was actually on the same track as me. Um, my thoughts were around the... Uh, um, uh, the, the existing bed and breakfasts that are operating and whether or not those um, which are legally operating would be given preference um, when receiving these new applications, understanding that there is a limit of 200. Through you, Go Chair. Ahead. Yep. Um, so the implementation plan has not been finalized at this point. However, that being said, um, we have categorized the licensing classes based on um, bed and breakfast, like the, the traditional bedroom rental versus the principal residence versus the um, accessory dwelling unit. So that's certainly something that we can look into as part of the implementation plan um, and can be included as part of the upcoming consultation as well. Um, all right, Councilor Doherty. Oh, Thank Vice you, Chair Doherty. Um, first Pardon of all, I me. just uh, oh, <laughs> thank, yeah, that's me. Um, just wanted to uh, just comment that um, I, I was really impressed by obviously the um, degree to which you have uh, done a review of best practices across other municipalities, having just come off a conference or two where we're talking about short-term accommodations, uh, there are uh, many different ways in which it can be done, and some are more successful than others. Uh, so um, thank you, and then also thank you for answering the questions that I sent. Um, I, I do continue to hold that um, we should offer some option to those who are not living in single family dwelling so even if you know, we say okay not in if it's sorry if it's uh, not the primary residence you're out no matter what okay that's fine but i think we should consider uh, townhomes or apartments because those are STAs too and uh, you know sometimes the um, the revenue that can come in uh, through rental of those smaller properties can be even more valuable to the owner um, next item um, I, I, th I thought that Perhaps the fees were too low. Either the, the registration fees were too low or we should allow for more um, uh, facilities because, you know, we have 350 uh, supposedly now. Um, so we're limiting it to 200. So, I mean, there, there should be some latitude to increase them that slightly. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that, uh, and also make my comments about uh, the fees, uh, is because this is not recoverable right now. And I just, I don't think that all of our community of taxpayers should have to foot the bill so that a minority get to make extra money. So we need to make it 
whatever it takes. Uh, we need to make it um, cost, rec cost recoverable. Um, next comment, uh, the demerits. Um, I had asked you a question about operating without a license. Uh, in the town of the Blue Mountains, if uh, an operator is is found not to have a license, they immediately are are banned from operating for the next two years. Uh, and I think that if we if we do it any other way, uh, then our prospect may say to themselves, "Well, it's easier to pay a fine. I'll I'll get that back in a couple of weeks." So I think we just we need to make the implications a little bit more onerous if they're if they're not operating with a license. Um, oh, and then there was another uh, question that I had, and this is also based on um, what they're doing down the street here: uh, administrative monetary penalties, so that, as I understand, we would not have to take these files to provincial court to prosecute, that we could in fact prosecute ourselves. So is that what your, I mean, you did uh, reference fines and collections of fines. Is that what you were thinking of? Uh, through you, Chair, we have drafted some proposed language in the licensing bylaw, and it is something that staff are exploring, implementing an AMPS program. Um, I have heard, for example, um, Romera is using the AMPS program, and to your point, they actually charge um, $3,000 uh, a day for operating without a license. So that's something else that we can explore um, if we were to increase the penalties relating to that specific provision, but mm -hmm. that is something we are exploring. And it would actually apply broader than just the short-term accommodation licensing. Um, we could look at applying it in uh, other town bylaws as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. And, and those are more questions. Okay. I have the deputy mayor and then the mayor. Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and I think I'll directly say thank you for the presentation to the county uh, meeting last week. Um, it, it's an excellent report. Um, it's a work in progress. I, I think everybody recognizes that. Uh, there's so many um, nuances to, to, to explore and have to deal with. And, and uh, the catch-22 of the idea of, of the fines being too high. Um, but I, I definitely appreciate what uh, Councillor Doherty has said about making sure that the uh, current taxpayer is not uh, footing any bill for this. But um, I, so just, I, I didn't really have any specific question, but I did want to make comment. And, and I do believe strongly in, in the efforts to try to make sure that any long-term rental um, uh, situations won't end up coming off market because of this, uh, this being set up. So um, we'll, we'll continue to work towards uh, achieving that. I'm also very interested to hear from the public as we go to the consultation part because um, we've, we've heard a lot from people who are working it and, and, and have dealt with it already and that, and now we, we need to, to hear from our public. But um, all the recent meetings I've attended, uh, the presentations on this subject, and it stands out to me that uh, it, we were informed at the Ocean that um, the Ontario Airbnb are actually starting to participate voluntarily participate in these uh, initiatives that are being undertaken by municipalities. And I think that's an important uh, part. They recognize that there's going to be regulation and they want to be part of the establishment of that. And and I'm so totally supportive of that because that's the association of the uh, of the people who are conforming to the regulations and, and establishing themselves as bread and breakfast. Um, I think all stakeholders um, have established that uh, there needs to be regulatory measures put in place to allow those normal short-term rentals that don't disrupt the character of the community. And uh, I read this morning uh, in Quebec, uh, the, the people um, who are, uh, there's a movement request in the province to regulate. Last Thursday um, at the meeting, um, there was a couple of comments that were similar to that. The reality is, though, that any short-term solution um, being put forward by the province is very, very unlikely. And um, it, it's one of those things where we're kind of having to all do it ourselves as municipalities, and we've encountered that in other cases. So um, I, I really like the process we're undertaking, and, and I look forward to the consultation part and hearing from the public 
feedback on on what they feel are uh, are, are key things too. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Uh, the turn this off. No, it's working. Oh, it's good. Okay. Um, I also wanted to follow up with uh, what Councillor Houston said about um, preferences being given to those who are now operating legally as bed and breakfast. And they may have a non-conforming status anyway, depending on the zoning changes. So I uh, hope we'll give consideration to that. Um, my overall you know, take on, on this is I have yet to see any jurisdiction successfully deal with short-term accommodation, like none. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know what this means or where we're going to end up on this, but the most frank discussion I've heard about this was at the OSM conference uh, last month. And what they had was uh, three uh, senior people from three municipalities who discussed how they have got their regulations in place and their challenges that there still exist. And if you haven't had an opportunity to listen, or have you? No, anyway, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the discussion, um, I'd be happy to facilitate, uh, facilitate that. Because what we learned was uh, two municipalities who were speaking spent years getting the regulations in place, years. Um, and they, are, they still have about half of the short-term accommodation units are not registered. So they, they, they have hundreds that are still not registered. Um, and I think it's a question of how much money as a municipality we want to put into enforcement. Uh, and also, it strikes me, it's a bit, a bit like that game of walk, what do they call it, whack-a-mole? Like you hit one down, another one pops up. <laughs> it's a bit like that, because I think in a lot of cases, the short-term accommodations, they're commercial operations, because as we know, they are hotels without hotel units without on-site management. That's how I look at them. And if you own more than one, you're pretty, it's pretty much a commercial operation. So there are, as far as I can tell, at least in these municipalities that we heard from, um, they're always looking to get around the rules. And um, it's very difficult to get them to get themselves licensed. And even in Toronto, I heard, because I got my ear now tuned to this, because I know we're dealing with it, but I heard last week that Toronto, who spent years in the courts to get their bylaw in place, um, what they're dealing with now, like people are required to register, or put their registration number on everything, uh, but what they're finding is people are just using other people's registration numbers because <laughs> they're not registered. <laughs> so, you know, they'll do anything, uh, some of these operators, to avoid uh, getting caught. So I was really intrigued um, by what I was reading. Deputy Mayor uh, mentioned, but I was reading an article this morning about what Quebec's doing, and I really love what they're doing. So they're bringing a province why uh, look at this, which we won't have, but the, the fines, and to me, this is the only way to control it. So I think their fines are, let me just see what they said, 100000 for each illegal rental listing. Yeah. Um, because you have to remember, if someone's renting their place out for $300 a night, and let's say they rent it for 300 nights a year, that's ninety grand. So what's a $50 fine going to do? $2,000 fine. It's like a cost to do business. But if it's a $100,000 fine, well, that's a year's income <laughs> for some. For some, it'll still be half a year's income. So one of the things I really hope that we'll focus on when we go to the public is how much is how much should the fine be to, that's a deterrent? And I don't know if we have maximum amounts we can impose as municipalities, so that's the other side of it. But And if it's not enough, then I'm happy to go down to Queen's Park and say, or maybe we add it to our delegation list, a themo. <laughs> you know, we need to be able to find enough to make it a deterrent. Because otherwise, you know, maybe what we do is, I don't, I don't totally agree that we have to learn to live with it or that they're not going away. I think it's all a matter of if we say no longer long-term accommodation that we put the money behind uh, making sure it doesn't happen and if it means hundred you know but it's all I mean do we want some and how to, and how much do we want to put behind 
uh, enforcing it. And if we don't want these, you know, hotel units in our community taking up housing, being bad neighbors, because <laughs> many of them are bad neighbors, then we're going to have to put money in, in into it. So anyway, I just wanted to share all that because it's on my mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think Councilor Ring, did you have a follow up to that? No, excuse me. It's just more of a comment from the last Thursday in Simcoe, where uh, through the county uh, session that um, was brought up by people in the in the audience that are, are working on their own STA uh, programs, and uh, when uh, Mayor Hamlin just mentioned the people renting them out for three hundred a night, that's uh, maybe. I don't know. That might get you in the door in a lot of them. Um, there was there was a instant where somebody said in uh, Clearview, there was a place in Creemore that was going for thirteen thousand a weekend. So I mean, <laughs> they're making piles of money. So I mean, a couple hundred dollar fine is not going to is deter anything when people are making that kind of money. All right. Um, so everybody has spoken, and I have a couple questions, so I'm just going to uh, throw the chair over to Vice Chair Doherty just so I can uh, put these in. Uh, and I do agree with the comments on the um, fine having to be enough. And I think what was pointed out to me by Town of Blue Mountains representatives, that by the fact that we don't have some form of regulation, we become the breeding ground because they're just avoiding uh, the licensing fees in other areas. So if you do nothing, I think it's worse than at least trying uh, something. So uh, with that, uh, my observation in terms of the volume of rentals for license occasional i just wanted to make sure we had the right uh, amount in there for fees because there's scenarios that are going to generate a lot more revenue than others and i think that license fee should reflect that i'm also wondering i suppose that the privacy legislation prohibits us uh, you know in, in the spirit of the competition uh, non-competitor trying not to compete with hotels and things that um that we require some kind of proof that they are actually filing their rental income with CRA. Cause I think it's hardly fair for us to initiate a licensing scenario where people can make money and not claim it. I think that's difficult for me. Um, do we contemplate an, uh, an administrative uh, wait list, one that's fair in terms of if when a license does become available or is not renewed, how does that fairly put out uh, to those who wish to, to um, compete for that? Um, and I'm assuming all of the inspection fees were in the fee that there's not inspection fees over and above. Maybe just is that's a correct assumption? Ms. The, yeah. the, the licensing fee includes the initial inspection, but if there were to be a, a re-inspection for some reason, the fire department needed to come back, then there would be a re-inspection re fee. And that's typically seen in most municipalities. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then in terms of our administrative, I was just wondering in terms of the extra staff, is there a way that staff shifts can occur that we have 8.30 to 4.30 and 3.30 to 11.30 and then we're not trying to hire two levels of staff for the two time slots in terms of making sure that it's enforced around the clock. And um, I think that's it for me so far. So I think everybody asked excellent questions which were on the list. So if there's no other questions, then um, I will call for the vote. I think we all know what we're voting on. We don't need that reread in. Okay, all those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Phone, for a terrific job with your team. Okay, so next up. Uh, 6.2, it's the approval and authorization bylaws to execute subdivision and site plan control agreements for 400 Maple Street, uh, the annex, and Director Valentine will introduce. Please, Director. Excellent. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So the matters before you today as part of this item include consideration of approval of a site plan and the related agreement and the execution of a subdivision agreement. The previous council conditionally approved this development through a draft plan of subdivision. So what that means essentially is the pr principle of development has already been established through the official plan designation and the zoning bylaw provisions. In addition to that, the lot fabric, the infrastructure layout, the easements and other details were already conditionally approved through the draft plan of subdivision process. An exemption to the interim control bylaw was granted for this site. 
municipal servicing capacity was allocated at the same time, which was fall of last year. And initial heritage permits have been issued for the exterior renovation of the Victoria Annex School building. And that was in consultation with the Heritage Committee. So that brings us to today, which is all about the technical details about how this site will ultimately develop to positively enhance the public interest. So we do have both Manager Ayers from our Planning Services team and Manager West on behalf of Engineering Services, who have worked diligently on this file with the proponent and the external agencies whose interests would be impacted by the proposal. We do have Manager Ayers here today to lead you through the presentation, which will also include a brief history of the file. And uh, she will flesh out some of the key details that were outlined in the staff report. And I do believe Manager West is online as well if there are additional questions for him. Thank you, Madam Chair, okay. and happy to turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Ayers at your concurrence. Thank you. Welcome, Manager Ayers. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, uh, members of council and members of the public attending in the audience and virtually uh, this afternoon. Uh, so this presentation will provide an overview of the proposed plan of subdivision and site plan applications to facilitate a residential development at 400 Maple Street. Um, as Director Valentine indicated, this report was jointly prepared by myself and Manager West, and he is in attendance uh, virtually this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a 2022 aerial image of the subject property, which is located on the north side of 6th Street, the west side of Maple Street, and the south side of 5th Street. The property is a point, approximately 0.6 hectares in size and is designated as a property of cultural heritage value or interest under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act due to the existing Victoria School Annex building. Surrounding land uses include predominantly single detached residential dwellings. Next slide, please. So the proposed development has been the subject of active planning applications for approximately three years. The pre-consultation application was submitted in June of 2020, followed by formal planning act applications for a zoning bylaw amendment, draft plan of subdivision and site plan control in November of 2020. Those applications were deemed complete on December 11th, 2020 and a statutory public meeting was held on January 25th, 2021. The proposed development was extensively reviewed by town departments, external agencies, and third-party peer reviewers, and the zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision were approved by council in September of 2022. Council also granted servicing capacity allocation and an exemption to the interim control bylaw at that time. An application for subdivision agreement and registration was subsequently received in November of 2022, and further extensive review was undertaken over the last several months under the charge of engineering services. The principle of development has already been established for the subject property. Planning and engineering services are now recommending council approve these two applications, which are more technical in nature, so that the subdivision agreement can be finalized and executed, and the plan of subdivision and associated um, agreement can be registered. And then that would be followed by execution and registration of the site plan control agreement for the proposed condominium block. Next slide, please. So the Town of Collingwood official plan designates the subject lands as medium density residential exception three. Permitted uses are limited to single detached, semi-detached and townhouse dwellings, as well as one walk-up apartment. Furthermore, a maximum of 19 dwelling units are permitted. The medium density residential exception three designation also contains policies that require the architectural design and landscape design of buildings be sympathetic with the character of the existing Victoria School Annex building and the adjacent residential neighborhood. The town zoning bylaw zones the lands proposed around the perimeter of the site as residential third density exception 64 and the proposed condominium block containing the Victoria School Annex building as residential third density exception 65. Both the R364 and R365 zones contain site specific exceptions, including limiting the types of dwelling units permitted, establishing a maximum number of dwelling units, and establishing a number of site specific provisions that address minimum lot area, maximum lot coverage, minimum landscape open space, maximum building height, and various building setbacks. And these site specific provisions are intended to ensure that the proposed development concept is implemented by as presented by the owner next slide please 
So the plan of subdivision proposes to create nine lots, three blocks, and two easements. The proposed nine lots are comprised of four lots for single detached dwellings and five lots for 10 semi-detached dwellings, which would be further subdivided by part lot control in the future. The four single detached lots are located on each corner of the subject property with the semi-detached lots located in between. The proposed three blocks are comprised of one condominium block as outlined in blue on the screen. And that condominium block would include two semi-detached dwellings in the existing Victoria School Annex building and three townhouse dwellings in a proposed coach house. The other two blocks are proposed as daylight triangles as indicated in the, the green triangles on the screen and they are to be conveyed to the town. The proposed two easements include one easement in favour of the town for the installation and maintenance of the proposed Wilson Memorial landscape feature at the corner of Maple and 6th Streets and one private easement uh, to be created over lots 2 through 8 in favour of the future condominium block to address stormwater management responsibilities. The subdivision agreement contains a number of special terms and conditions to ensure that the conditions of draft plan approval are satisfied. There are clauses in the agreement to specifically address the required construction management plan, stormwater management easements, external works, and tree management and planting. And I would note that the, the requirements regarding tree management and planting include the owner's commitment to provide 13 deciduous trees to the town in addition to the 15 proposed street trees as compensation for the recent removal of the eight mature street trees along 5th, 6th, and Maple Streets. And furthermore, the subdivision agreement contains clauses pertaining to the financial and security considerations, including a $25,000 legal deposit, approximately $42,000 in engineering fees, approximately $845,000 in securities, and $82,500 for cash in lieu of parkland ded dedication. Next slide, please. So this slide illustrates the site plan for the proposed condominium block, which includes the existing Victoria School Annex building, a proposed coach house building that would contain three townhouse dwelling units, and a detached accessory building for a proposed garage. The site plan control agreement would only apply to the condominium block and contains a number of special terms and conditions, including required easements for private storm sewers, implementation of the heritage conservation plan and an associated heritage conservation easement for the existing Victoria School Annex building, future condominium descriptions and requirements pertaining to private waste collection services. The site plan agreement also contains clauses pertaining to financial and security considerations, which are specific to the proposed condominium block, including a required $5,000 legal deposit, approximately $8,000 in engineering fees, approximately $263,000 in securities and appropriate insurance. Next slide, please. So this slide primarily illustrates the landscape plan for the proposed condominium block. However, you will note it also illustrates the proposed 15 new boulevard trees around the perimeter of the site, as well as the proposed landscaping at the southeast and northeast corners of the subject property. The owner has agreed to convey an easement in favour of the town at the corner of Maple and 6th Streets for installation and maintenance of the Wilson Memorial tree feature by the town. Next slide, please. So the following three slides illustrate the existing and proposed streetscapes associated with this residential development. These were presented to council last fall, but I've included them again because I know there are a number of new members of council that are perhaps not as familiar with this proposed development. It's important to note that the design of the single detached and semi-detached dwellings that are proposed around the perimeter of the screen or per perimeter of the site and as indicated on the screen are directly representative of the proposed building elevations including exterior building materials and colors and they have been extensively reviewed uh, through the architectural design guidelines that have been appended to the report. So this first slide uh, represents the existing and proposed Maple Street streetscape. Next slide please. This illustrates the existing and proposed 6th Street streetscape and finally the next slide represents the existing and proposed 5th Street streetscape. 
Next slide, please. So this uh, list identifies the various studies and reports submitted in support of the proposed development that have been extensively reviewed by the applicable town departments, external commenting agencies, and third-party peer reviewers. Next slide, please. The proposed development is consistent and in conformity with all of the applicable provincial and municipal planning policy and regulatory instruments as outlined in the staff report. The proposal represents intensification of an existing underutilized lot and underutilized and municipally serviced lot in the Collingwood intensification area. Furthermore, the proposed development not only conserves but restores a significant heritage building designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. The proposal would contribute towards the achievement of complete communities and compact urban form and would further expand the provision of a diverse range and mix of housing options in Collingwood. The subject applications were circulated to town departments, applicable third-party peer reviewers, and external commenting agencies for review and comment, and all matters have been sufficiently addressed. Next slide, please. So in summary, the principle of development has already been established through official plan and zoning bylaw amendments approved by previous councils in 2012 and 2022 respectively. Draft plan approval for the, for the subdivision was granted by council in September of 2022. Approximately 18 single dwelling unit equivalents or SDUs of water and 17 SDUs of wastewater are required to facilitate the proposed development. In September of 2022, Council approved servicing capacity allocation for the proposed development and granted an exemption to the provisions of the town's interim control bylaw for the subject property. Final technical matters are being addressed through the subdivision agreement, and if approved by council, the agreement would be executed and the plan of subdivision and agreement would subsequently be registered. Upon creation of the proposed lots and blocks, the site plan control agreement would be executed and registered for the condominium block. And finally, a future condominium exemption application is anticipated for the proposed condominium block, which would be considered pursuant to staff delegated authority. And this concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions the committee may have, as is Manager West. And I understand the applicant is also attending uh, virtually this, this afternoon, should members of the committee have any specific questions for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manager Ayer. So firstly, we'll ask if there's anyone in the gallery wishing to speak to specifically item 6.2 regarding 400 Maple Street. And seeing none, then Clerk Almas, I'll ask you to check online, please. Certainly, to our remote participants, if you'd like to address uh, the Committee of the Whole regarding this report, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And not at this time, Chair. Okay, so uh, for Council, our motion this evening reads as follows, and it's a little lengthy. The staff report P2023-14, approval and authorization bylaws to execute subdivision and site plan control agreements, 400 Maple Street, the Annex, dated May 15, 2023, be received. And that plan of subdivision application file number D1208222 be approved subject to the following conditions. Any outstanding technical comments be addressed to the satisfaction of the Director of Public Works, Engineering and Environmental Services, and execution of a subdivision agreement with the town of Collingwood to the satisfaction of the Director, Public Works, Engineering and Environmental Services and Town Solicitor, and that an authorization bylaw to execute the subdivision agreement for the residential development at 400 Maple Street be enacted and passed, and that site plan application file number D111820 be approved subject to the following conditions, execution of the subdivision agreement and registration of the plan of subdivision and execution of a site plan control agreement with the town of Collingwood to the satisfaction of the director planning, building and economic development and town solicitor and that an authorization by law to execute a site plan control agreement for the residential condominium block, block 10 at 400 Maple Street be enacted and passed. We have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Potts and Councillor Perry. And questions or comments? Councillor Maines. Thank you, um, Chair Jeffrey. Through you to, I suppose, uh, Manager Ayers. Um, 
I love the planning speak, but can you <laughs> describe what I think is <laughs> enter in a reverse motion and exit in a forward motion onto Maple? I'm assuming that's both the recycling trucks and the garbage trucks, but that they have to back in. Is that correct? In order to for a garbage recycling waste, let's go waste truck to access and circulate internal to the site and then leave access in a forward motion and leave in a forward motion, which is typically what we request of developments. But given the sensitivity around the, the heritage building and, and the, the land available um, upon, you know, extensive review by the engineering services team, it was agreed that uh, it was most supportable to request that the waste truck reverse in um, and then exit in a forward motion rather than go in in a forward motion and then back up onto Maple Street. Thank you. That's what I thought, but <laughs> good for the explanation anyway. Uh, a further question, if I might. I see two parking spaces for the five condo uh, units. Um, to the other freehold units, are the driveways going to be wide enough for two cars or just one? And if they're just one... Will uh, visitors be allowed to park on 5th, 6th, or Maple in front of those freehold, well, what space is available in front of those freehold, freehold units? Manager, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you to Councillor Baines. Um, so with respect to the five units in the proposed condominium block, um, the, the required parking in that setup is that there be two parking spaces per unit plus an additional 0.25 parking spaces for visitor parking. Um, the nature of that that configuration, they're considered group or cluster dwellings under our zoning bylaw. So there is a requirement for visitor parking. So there are uh, there are two car garages allocated for each townhouse unit, and then the detached accessory building that I referenced in the presentation will contain the two cars parking for the two semi-detached dwellings in the annex building, and then there is some visitor parking available on the surface. With respect to the freehold uh, single and semi-detached dwellings the zoning bylaw requires two parking spaces per unit and each lot is designed to accommodate two parking spaces um, I believe one of the parking spaces will be in the garage each unit has either an attached or a detached garage associated with it um, but th there will be an ability to accommodate uh, two vehicles on each lot uh, unfortunately I, I'm not in a position to comment about uh, what bylaw uh, by parking bylaws may be in place on 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 6th, 5th, and and Maple Street, uh, but I would presume if on-street parking is currently permitted, there's no proposal at this point to to amend that that parking bylaw. Thank you very much. I obviously misunderstood in regard to the, <clears throat> the total parking for visitors in the condo portion, so thank you for setting me correct. Okay, any other questions or comments, Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you. Uh, Kind of hard to imagine that uh, after attending Victoria School for its last year operation as a public school that I'm here 56 years later deciding about its redevelopment with nothing happening in between. Um, an understandable major barrier to the development of the property has been Collingwood's adherence to maintain the heritage of this important local man landmark. And I just wanted to acknowledge that because uh, I'm thankful that that position has been in place for a number of years with the heritage preservation of the former King George School and the original uh, Connaught School restorations. Um, and well before we had the uh, Municipal Registry of Cultural Heritage, um, the earlier discussion is even about making adjustments to the service access as best possible to maintain the heritage aspects of the annex. Um, so what I wanted to comment uh, was that as outlined in the report, there's seven special clauses in the subdivision agreement that incorporate all of the assurances uh, by the developer that the work will be done to um, that which planning services is basing its recommendations to us on. Um, so for me, that's an important component and the main reason I support the uh, subdivision uh, agreement going uh, as, as set out. Um, also, I do believe it appears that there'll be a diverse dwellings uh, uh, situation here when it's established, and some of which will hopefully be in an affordable range, which we can't control, but we're, we're certainly hopeful that, uh, that, that it comes to fruition. So um, I'm very supportive of, the, of, the, of this. Okay, thank, thank you, you for those comments. 
All right, so seeing no other yellow cards, we have a mover, a seconder, and we know what the motion is. So all those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Right, so moving on. Uh, 6.3, uh, PW 2023-12, local improvement charges, and I'd ask Director Slama to introduce, and uh, I think Manager Cole will take us through the uh, a verbal report. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we do have uh, Manager Cole uh, here this evening, and so he's going to speak to the staff report that's uh, in front of committee. Okay, thank you. This afternoon. Manager Cole, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in January of this year, Council received a petition from a group of local residents requesting the paving of a rear lane access between Minnesota Street and Napier. This petition prompted a question of Council of when a capital project is considered a local improvement and a request of staff to prepare an information report on when an investment is a local improvement and the process for pursuing this approach. Under the Local Improvement Act and Ontario Regulation 58606, local improvement works can include a variety of new or replacement municipal infrastructure where the work is undertaken on municipal lands or where assets benefit a specific group of properties. The Act does not apply to works that benefit the town as a whole. The staff report outlines the type of work and project costs included under the Act and Appendix B includes a detailed step-by-step -step process flowchart on the entire local improvement process from project initiation through to completion. It should be noted that the local improvement works can be initiated by a benefiting landowner or property owners as a group or the municipality itself. Following receipt of this report, clerks will reach out to the original petitioner and commence the local process with this group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the public at this portion. Uh, if there's anyone in the gallery wishing to speak specifically with this item, <clears throat> seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to check online, please. Uh, there is none, Your Worship. Well, I guess got a promotion. Okay, so seeing this, uh, our report the, or our motion this evening is simply that staff report um, PW 2023 12 local improvement charges be received for information. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Mayor Hamlin and Vice Chair Doherty, comments with respect to this? Uh, Vice Chair Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and just uh, quickly, um, thank you very much for this thorough explanation as to um, how we uh, make decisions uh, relative to local improvements. Um, I'm wondering also with regard to uh, the residents from whom this request first came, will they be advised uh, that this is a process and uh, provided with the um, uh, guidelines as to uh, getting uh, or seeking their um, um, participation with their neighbors. Yeah. So I, I what I, I do think that Manager Cole said that the uh, staff would be going back to the original petitioners on this to explain uh, the process. But if there's something further, Manager Cole, please go ahead. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, that, that is correct. Uh, clerks will reach out to the original pet petitioner and all the information that we have available, including the new forms, the petition forms, and the process will be made available to them. Great. Thank you. Perfect. I'll have to clean out my ears the next time. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> See you, Hill Skinner. Thank you, Chair. I just did want to uh, mention a couple of things related to this report, and many thanks to Manager Cole for putting it together, in, a, in addition to a few other things he's been doing um, on the policy front for that you'll see soon. Um, this is one of the most common areas of misunderstanding for folks, uh, who residents and businesses who live in town. Um, I think the general thought is that if your area gets busier, that the town taxes will, will pay for these upgrades. 
Uh, but for the types of items that Manager Cole has mentioned that uh, service an individual area, the extension of a water line or a wastewater line, curbs and gutters, in some cases, uh, uh, sidewalks, uh, lighting, um, it may be in case uh, the fact that the local residents will pay for that improvement if it wasn't um, installed when the development was first, up, uh, first built. Um, and subsequently, your normal land taxes will pay for the ongoing asset management and renewal of those once they're installed. And um, I think it's really important to keep in mind if you're, you're moving houses or you're purchasing a, house, purchasing a house or you're looking for advice from your realtor, for example, um, you know, what the situation is in all municipalities, not only here in, here in Collingwood with respect to these local improvements and... Um, uh, how nice it is to move into a development that has them already. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And, and uh, I, I do agree the report is very detailed. Um, it doesn't really get into the specifics in regards to how the um, the costs would be assessed. Um, and, and this is something that CO Skinner was just reviewing. Is um, and and I'm not going to look to Manager Cole to include that at this point in time. But there is a process where if there's municipal property involved, um, then that gets exempted out of the calculation uh, table for figuring things out. And there may be some services that have to be covered by the municipality, but I do believe in this particular case, um, from what I can see, there's, there's no municipal property involved. And and uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm not looking to get an explanation of the of this. If they take the the petition forward, then um, they'll be bringing that forward to us. So, um, but uh, it's. Uh, Having participated in local improvements before, um, they're they're a great mechanism for the public to get something done if they would like it, if they're willing to put the, the dollars forward to do it. So I'm very supportive of the process, and uh, and we'll look forward to what the residents want to do with this particular one. Okay, thank you. All right, so no other comments. Uh, we'll vote on receiving the report. All those in favor. That is carried unanimously, and we are scheduled for a break. And with everyone's permission, we will reconvene at 5 o'clock to keep the timing for our deputations. All good? Okay, so we will uh, recess until 5 o'clock.
Okay, everyone. So we are re reconvening at uh, 5 p.m. This is our Committee of the Whole meeting. And uh, we're pleased to have several deputations this evening. And we're going to start with those. Uh, we are going to change the order. Um, we're going to have the 5.3 uh, panorama uh, go forth, which means we'll be moving uh, Mr. Doherty up to number three. And then uh, we'll move right into 6.6, .6, which is the uh, panorama uh, staff report. Uh, and then we'll come back up and then continue in order. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, that's great. So uh, very pleased to welcome someone who's no stranger to council. And we have Mr. Jack Vanderkoy here, uh, representing today the Institute of uh, South Georgian, Southern Georgian Bay, uh, and to give us a little bit of information on the affordable housing toolkit. Jack, please come on forward. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and council members, staff. Uh, it's my privilege to be here and thank you for putting us on your agenda. Um, my name is Jack Vanderkoy, as I've been introduced, no stranger to you, so it's good to be amongst friends, I always say. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Institute for Southern Georgian Bay and uh, that we had a social finance and housing group that's been meeting probably for the past two years. It started during COVID, so everything was done on Zoom. We never had to travel anywhere, and our meetings were very efficient, but we learned a lot. Um, this is a cross-sectoral group, and it includes uh, business leaders, municipal leaders, um, philanthropy, and uh, housing advocates. And we've been exploring issues and solutions surrounding the housing affordability crisis that has arisen over the past few years. This work has developed within the context of the three um, UN Habitat in Towns Collingwood World Summits, which most many of you have participated, and through the participation in a year-long Social Innovation Canada and CMHC partnership. Uh, 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 it was an innovation lab that we participated on representing rural communities. The Institute has also hosted several community discussions over the past year uh, to help others learn more about the housing system and the affordability crisis. These discussions are ongoing with more expected this year um, after a very successful event held only a week and a half ago. Um, and again, we had 80 participants from the region um, on that particular Zoom call and uh, there was great interest by, uh, by everyone in attendance. This work has fostered rich systems discussions on how development takes mm -hmm. place in our communities and how we can be doing things differently and how we must all contribute to achieving affordable housing for everyone in our communities. We may not have caused this problem, but this is our problem to solve as it affects each one of us, our families, our neighbors, our businesses, and it will impact the future sustainability of our communities if we don't address this critical issue. Our learnings have been packaged and released as an online affordable housing toolkit which is accessible on the Institute website. And if you don't know what it is, it's really not complicated. T-I-S-G-B, you can write it down, T-I-S-G-B.com. And right across the top, you'll see the affordable housing toolkit with all the different components on it. Um, it's a very dense product. So don't think you're gonna get through it in one sitting, but as you need it, you can refer to it and, uh, and uh, take advantage of some of the learnings that we are sharing on that toolkit. And so we're encouraging you, um, as well as members of the public, to access this toolkit and to consider how the solutions identified within can be put into action into our, in our communities. And what we've learned through this process is that people who work in our local communities are having trouble finding places to live <coughs> because the cost of renting and buying a home has increased substantially and relatively quickly. This is not news. You all heard it on the campaign trail. You're probably hearing it every day in the newspaper. Um, this is a very this is well known for all of us and in rural communities uh, more specifically. When there isn't enough housing that people can afford, it makes it difficult for a community to function well. And it can make it hard for businesses and public agencies to find employees. Additional affordable unit supply is needed. However, the costs of building new housing have also increased substantially over the course of the pandemic. And so we expect that we will need different groups like government, 
businesses, nonprofits, charities, and local investors to work together collaboratively and to explore creative financing models so that we can progress faster. And there is urgency to this work, both because housing is a human right and because the problem is growing in scale. Recent analysis by the Royal Bank of Canada Economics, for example, warns that unless the pace of construction of purpose-built rental housing in particular accelerates, the current shortage of 30,000 units across Canada could quadruple by 2026 based upon immigration, declining housing affordability, and rising mortgage rates. Locally, Recent data released through the Housing, Affordab Housing Affordability Resource Tool, um, HART, it's called H-A-R-T, project at the University of BC has identified Simcoe County has a deficit of nearly 24,000 affordable units, with Collingwood specifically short by nearly 1,600 affordable units. <coughs> with more than 1,200 households living in core housing need, unable to afford a monthly housing cost of more than $800 a month. Market rentals available are listed around the average of $1,850 a month, plus utilities with very little supply available. We believe that we can, through collaboration and a shift in mindset, find ways to support supply both at this deeply affordable price point and at market rates. And it's not only about money. This is a systems issue. And so we can employ a variety of different interventions through policy, process, and partnerships as well. For the financial component of this issue, innovative financial solutions will also be required. And we continue to explore some of the financial solutions being developed in other Canadian communities. Our learnings thus far are included within the toolkit, but they, included social, they include social finance opportunities, they include angel investors, they include developers partnering with other charities to be able to increase the affordable housing supply. We see the county and local governments as well positioned to do this work. And while developers create housing, municipalities create and foster communities and are well practiced especially in small urban and rural communities, to embrace a leadership role, to be proactive, and to really lean into the provision of good governance in collaborative and creative ways to address this crisis situation. This is especially important as the impact of this crisis play out at the local level as we all experience here. And so with that, I encourage you each to check out the toolkit online. Remember, T-I-S-G-B. You can almost make a song out of it. <laughs> T-I-S-G-B dot com. Um, take a look at it and, and, and do some exploring. And give us some feedback on that. If there's something we're missing, we'd like to know. And let's put on our creative thinking hats to support the sustainability of our communities. As we know, it is so integral to our collective well-being, which provides housing for all. Thank you, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you would allow, Madam Chair. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Jack. It's so much value added and assistance for our committee to have uh, a resource like you and the, the Institute. And whether you're wearing your uh, Habitat for Humanity hat or your affordable, calling with Affordable Housing Task Force hat, um, we really appreciate what you're doing. Are there any questions for Jack tonight? I think we'll all take it upon ourselves to check out the toolkit and really appreciate you being here. So thank, thank you very you. much. Right, so next up, we have a resident, Catherine Campbell, who would like to speak to us about a parking uh, uh, observation she's made on her street, Bar Street. So Catherine, and she's new, this is her first time presenting to a council, so we are very pleased that she's taken this opportunity because that's why we have these meetings, so residents can come and speak to us. So welcome, Catherine. Take a deep breath. We will be timing you, and I'll give you a, a one-minute warning if we think you're, you're getting close. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity of coming up here and talking to you with regards to just some uh, parking issues I've noticed since returning back to Collingwood. Um, I left here uh, 10 years ago, um, and I've been fighting in court to come back so my son could attend high school. So I've been in court for 10 years, and I'm so thrilled to be back here. I purchased a house last March um, at the height of the market, and I had to fight with 
um, previously living or trying to purchase in Wasaga ended up purchasing here uh, based on the proximity of my son being at a school. Moving in, I was visited by um, the bylaw office with regards to drainage, which is a separate issue, but it's all part and parcel because as I'm trying to do home renovations, I have found it's very difficult for me to park on my street. Um, there doesn't seem to be any rules um, from what I'm understanding. And I'm here standing in front of you based on a, an incident that caused a lot of trauma last year while I was trying to solve the drainage issue with four rocks, four yards of river rock. My vehicle was parked on the street um, and one of the residents <coughs> came. Um, it was there for four days and notified me that I am not allowed to park in his spot on the road. Um, that he owns that spot and has owned it for 14 years. And um, was very irate with me. And since then, we started documenting some of what we're, my, our family is calling chaos of, of Collingwood. Um, we have just, I don't know how to send it to you, but I just have some pictures. We have vehicles parking in the same direction. <laughs> no, many times, they're facing each other. We have, in front of our home, it's a town home. It's 15 feet. Based on the current bylaw, you need one meter on either side. Vehicles are 14 feet. And as you can see, uh, this <coughs> is in front of my house, there is not a meter on either side. So I'm not able to park my vehicle. This vehicle is the owner who came and screamed at me and told me that he owns the parking. This is a typical parking. It's a 15 foot berm and we have two vehicles jockeying it. This does not get a ticket. My vehicle was in the berm and I received a $30 ticket. Unbeknownst to me, I was just following <laughs> what, what the parking has been on the street, which has been chaotic. So I have moved, this is my vehicle being completely parked blocked in and I can't get out in emergencies. Here's another one. It's just chaotic. We have, um, you can't park during the winter, but this vehicle parks nonstop. It gets plowed in. So my question is, based on the three other towns I've lived at, in, um, Halton, town of Milton, town of Oakville, they all have um, parking parameters which allow homeowners to per park in front of their home for a certain duration of time, not an entire year, and not to claim ownership of parking on the road. So in Oakville, there is on-street parking permit after 15 days of residence. When I lived there 20 years ago, we were allowed to have 28 days per vehicle, per license, Per residence. So if you had five vehicles, you could park each licensed vehicle per home on the street for a maximum of 24 days, 29 days. They've reduced it down to 15. We have other uh, municipalities that allow a one day permit that I could come to the town if my vehicle has exceeded the one month, two weeks. And I can purchase that. So my question is, in dealing with the bylaw office, they're telling me they don't have enough officers to um, mandate and parking. So my question is, most other municipalities have widened the parking parameters and not just had it where you can't park in the winter because clearly that's not working. So some of the comparisons of other towns would be to have parking limitations in terms of you don't park on the street at night at any time unless you have a permit. It should have one resident shouldn't feel that they own a piece of the street. So as a result, I can't do the maintenance of my house because I need to put my vehicles on the road, but there is no parking for me and I can't purchase a parking permit. So it seems that it would be advantageous for the committee maybe to look at some other towns and cities 
town, sorry, because we're not a city, and just look at what they're doing in terms of parking. Uh, just to touch on the fact of the housing being so astronomical, many of these parking spots are freeing up spaces in the driveway. I myself have four parking spots on my driveway, plus a garage. People on the other side have three plus a garage, that's four. I don't know why that would entitle someone to require to own the street or a spot on the street. So there could be a way for you to increase your <coughs> restrictions to help generate more tickets so that you can get more parking officers on the ground because your bylaw office is very busy and they shouldn't be dealing with parking. And we are very seasonal. I will give you just an example of what I've experienced on my street. My, one of the neighbor's garages is being rented out because of the housing crisis. So that's not for me to complain to you because we are in that housing crisis, but we're now allowing someone to live in their garage, put their vehicle on the road, put other vehicles on the road so they can then live in their vehicles on their driveway. And this is what I'm seeing. So it's a bigger issue, but it's a simple one. If we can look at making on-street parking at night from 2 to 6 a.m., not possible unless you're a resident, and if you're a resident, you have a capped amount of days per vehicle. Um, and maybe just do an analysis of what other towns are doing. I'm not here to tell what the town should do, but I do see that there's missed opportunities. Um, if we could look at maybe hiring and changing some of the bylaws. So thank you. I'm very nervous. This is very <laughs> no. No, Catherine, you. you've done a very terrific job of, of, of explaining your, your situation and your concerns. And I've asked uh, Clerk Almas to respond to you in terms of our ability to take your request forward. So, uh, thank Clerk you. Almas? Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. Sorry, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Chair Jeffrey. So, to address the, the concerns, the town's parking bylaws itself have over 50 different parking uh, prohibitions. Within them, uh, we do have uh, a rule that you can't park on your street uh, for an unreasonable length of time. That's generally three days uh, is what the uh, time limit is for that. Um, there is, um, since we do have so many prohibitions, we don't have everything signed as well. So it is important to become familiar uh, with the parking bylaws of your municipality. Um, the town's engineering department, and uh, Director Slama is here tonight, and she might be able to speak to it, was tasked with completing a, a guideline evaluating no parking uh, and stopping a request uh, in, in, I think, relation to the boulevard uh, concerns that uh, were raised uh, with uh, the previous council. And I believe that would uh, take in the evaluation for um, requests for no parking, stopping areas in various similar type zones. Okay, and uh, did you want to add something else, Director Slama? I know that you had advised me that uh, this report would be coming up, uh, you felt, perhaps the fourth quarter of this year in terms of uh, our ability to respond. Please, yes, ahead. thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that is correct. So there, we kind of have two parts to what uh, we're looking at this year, um, and that is um, w related to the boulevard beautification and, and parking. So uh, one part is looking at our road occupancy uh, permits um, in that bylaw, which uh, Manager Cole is working on and, and uh hopefully we'll be bringing uh, forward in, in June or July. And uh, the second part is looking at the uh, parking component and uh, with some good suggestions uh, brought forward by Ms. Campbell today, uh, we are scheduled to bring that forward to uh, committee and council in the fall this year. 
All right. Thank you very much for that. And I think the other thing that we can probably through staff assure uh, Ms. Campbell is that, that no one owns a spot on a street anywhere in Collingwood. So it's kind of like a first come, first serve, and uh, the bylaws there, if they're there for an unreasonable amount of time, then you do have a recourse to contact, uh, enforce uh, the bylaw enforcement and to proceed with that. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Mayor Hamlin. Hi, through you, Madam Chair, uh, just uh, through to you, to uh, Director Slama. Um, when you're looking at the bylaws to bring forward, will you be looking at generally the parking issues? Like, for example, this question um, that's on my mind is the bylaw says you can only park unless, you know, you can't park for an unreasonable length of time, which you could drive a truck through, <laughs> one could say. So are you going to be looking at like all the big issues? And I'll just add one more thing. <clears throat> you know, I have a resident who uh, emails me quite frequently, uh, and I'm glad now I know what I'll tell her you're looking at this. But they have uh, a neighbor who's, I guess, in a construction business and parks all manner of commercial vehicles in front of their home on their grass. Like they go up over the curb and they park and they're there all winter, all summer, and the car's always coming and going. And... <laughs> Oh, you know, like, are, are you going to go, you know, look at the whole broad issue about parking? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, through you, Madam Chair, uh, to um, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, yes, that's the intention, is to, uh, to look at um, it, how we, ways that we could um, allow parking on the boulevard, if that is uh, what council desires uh, in the bylaw. And then also looking at um, what exists in the parking bylaw today with respect to, you know, where we allow parking, where we don't, where um, where there are some restrictions. And of course, we'd be working closely with bylaw who have a lot of experience on that to and, and bringing it forward to council. I just have one follow-up yep, question, absolutely. which is, uh, do you expect a public consultation uh, specifically on this? Because I think there could be a lot of hot buttons here people might want to bring forward. Uh, Go ahead. The, yep. uh, thank you. Through the chair. Uh, it's a good suggestion, and I think that's something uh, that we could bring into consideration. I believe we were uh, considering uh, public consultation. I just don't remember um, if it was part of the original council motion. Thank you. Okay, I have Councillor Potts. CEO Skinner, did you want to add something but prior to Councillor? I just wanted to clarify, just based on my knowledge of our work plan for this year, we do have uh, absolutely the Boulevard beautification, which includes the permits for you know extended parking. And um, there is a guideline for evaluating parking from an engineering perspective, sight lines and the like for, for parking. Uh, I am hearing some good ideas around timing of parking and commercial vehicles and parking on your own lot requirements. It sounded like a bit of a larger scope than I think we'd anticipated and probably will require some uh, public consultation because I'm sure there'll be a lot of, uh, of um, comments from the public around how we... Uh, and, you know, what might be set in place. Uh, so I just wanted to say that because I think we'd have to take it away if we were looking at um, sort of a larger overhaul of the parking bylaw uh, fully as it, as it exists. And that particular entire piece is not within this year's work plan at the moment. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Potts, you go first and then I'll formulate something. Thanks, Chair Jeffrey. Um, I'm just looking for clarification, I guess, through Clerk Almas. Uh, I'm hearing two different things here. One is the boulevard uh, beautification that's going to be coming forward is is actual boulevards in front of properties. I think in the deputant's case here, um, the the parking that she's referring to is actually on the street physically. So I'm I'm just not sure. Do we have something in place where you know residents are allowed to park on the street for a period of time? Because I do I do recognize the challenge. Go ahead. Thank you. Certainly, uh, you can park on the streets. You can't during the winter months. Don't have the exact time frame, but during the evenings, and that is actually one of our bylaws that's enforced by the OPP. But during the, during the the days uh, during the summer, uh, you can park on there but you can't park for an unreasonable length of time, which has been, um, we've been uh, 72 hours and it's been uh, enforced based on that. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just want to check in with the CAO. Um, are you requiring direction from staff to ex or from the committee to ex uh, to recommend to council that we expand that 
public consultation? Um, thank you to the chair. Uh, I don't think we have the capacity to do that in 2023, and we'd be happy to take it uh, forward for consideration in the 2024 work planning um, and deliver the other parts which relate to the boulevard and the, the, the engineering guidelines for where new parking is sort of safe from a safety and engineering perspective to be uh, to be set out. All right, but in the meantime, then we are have the capacity to undertake awareness and education for um, the current uh, rules around parking? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. So uh, we have that. We're going to work it into our plan. Uh, Councillor Ring. Just a quick question. It comes up through you to uh, Clerk uh, almost. You just made a comment about the 72 hours being the length of time you can park on the street. Is that consecutive or like it? it consecutive. That is that's, correct. That's, yeah. They, somebody said you could drive a truck through it. I mean, that's. I mean, if you go to the store, go shop, and then now you start over? Like, I mean, start over. Then, so there's no limit. You, somebody can park on the street as much as they want, basically. I, unless someone takes that spot on them, yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I think we've heard a lot of uh, terrific input tonight for us going forward and for us to food for thought and how uh, some things maybe we need to address. So thank you again to our, our deputy for <laughs> attending here and uh, bringing those to our attention. All right, so that brings us to uh, 5.4, which is uh, Mr. Doherty regarding the Collingwood Tree Canopy Program. So welcome, Mr. Doherty. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Mayor, councillors and staff. Um, I love trees. Everyone does, don't they? And I have always loved trees. My wife and I have always respected nature. I lived in Mississauga for 36 years. Wood for almost two years. What happened was we lived on the Etobicoke Creek border and well, a new neighbor came in. Two months later, he cut down three mature, 60 years old, over 70 feet tall, one beautiful maple, two white pines. And when everyone found out on the street they all rallied up and tried to get him to change his mind. The person who was doing the work said, you know, I feel bad about this. I, I would rather you just ask me to trim it, trim the trees. That's what you should do. There's nothing wrong with that. He says, nope, take them down. Well, next day they were down. You know why he took the trees down? He wanted to grow some tomatoes. That's the reason. Boy, are all the neighbors are very upset with this. Anyway. After that, three weeks later, we put the house up for sale because every time we walked out the door, he was across the street, every time we walked out the door, we saw this huge space where trees were, and we were so sad. Yeah, uh, we're here. And now what's happened is, I, uh, well, went over to the maple cutting over on the annex and looked at the 5th and 6th Street maple tree cuttings, and uh, I realized why they took them down. I mean, they were putting up 15 driveways on three sides in a very dense operation. Uh, there's not a lot of space there, but they managed to get in 15 driveways and 15 units, plus one in the back. Uh, interesting. Uh, they took the trees down because the, the, the roots are, if you looked at the canopy, the roots mirror the canopy on, on these trees. So they wouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, they wanted to be able to just go in and go, shh, cut them all down. Well, it's too late now. Uh, the program in Collingwood is a great project, for, but from my perspective, I think there's a lot of shortfalls. Uh, planting new small trees only give people a sense that they are doing the right thing. The right thing is not cutting down mature trees in the first place but to work around them and incorporate the houses and townhouses and condos into a plan that's not another urban desert. They're not only valuable to, valuable to fight climate change, but in studies have increased values on homes and properties by 15 to $20,000 per mature tree. People gravitate to tree lots. They feel good and studies show the blood pressure is reduced when they walk through a treed areas. Trees live better in communities together, not alone. You don't just put a tree up. They work better together when you have a little group of trees. It's 
uh, they, their root systems communicate with one another. And they provide food and habitat for large and small creatures. So we need trees, and they need us to protect them. They can't speak their trees. So let's try to protect them as much as possible when it comes to mature. Now, to get back on target, developers like a clean slate when it comes to building. No impediments, and as an example of uh, uh, development, take the one north of Poplar on the west side of the train trail. Uh, Kirby and Portland streets are two of the streets there. An example of a community that has no sense of a community yet. No trees, straight lines, no parks, did I say no trees? Big houses, small lots. Perhaps after buying these homes, they just don't have any money left to buy a tree. And, well, bushes and flowers and pots are not trees. They really help the environment. To encourage the green canopy program, developers must stop thinking inside the box. Get out, take a look, let's do something a little different. They should not be allowed to clear-cut lots just to make their job easier. The builders are making the same mistakes over and over again, and they all expect a different result. And so are a lot of the people who are buying these homes. Go in there, and maybe they're not so happy afterwards. Buyer's remorse, and we're not even talking about the price. A community that has heart and trees will benefit Collingwood in the long run. This town has a choice, the carrot or the stick. Well, Bill 23 and the Ford government have taken away the stick. You know about that. Collingwood now has only the carrot. So I'm suggesting that with the tree canopy in mind, the first and best choice would be to preserve our mature and present canopy wherever new constructions take place. Planting new small saplings after the fact is difficult and generally risky. Arborists will tell you that when you plant a tree, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. That means it's a while before you see anything other than what you planted. Many factors determine the life expectancy of, of a new planting. Site, weather, and maintenance, and expect a failure. In fact, expect quite a few. On average, 20% of the trees planted die. And for obvious reasons, they're not cared for and whatnot. There's a, a it's called plant and leave. That you can get up to 60% death rate for when they're just planted and left. Because maybe it doesn't rain. Maybe, maybe it's the wrong soil. Maybe it's the wrong type of tree. I propose something new. A, a way that is a win-win for both Coinwood and the developers. If the developers or builders were to follow certain guidelines in conjunction with Collingwood to preserve some mature trees on their building sites, Collingwood would give them, this is my suggestion, would give them a special status that they could use on their brochures. Example, and just an example, Collingwood, green, green trees for the future, uh, sorry, trees for tomorrow. I mean, you can find anything you want to say, but I'm just, the point is, it would be something that would be identified with a green uh, a projection and that they would love to have on their uh, brochures. It would only add to the value of their homes. Also, if they planted trees and not saplings on the boulevards or provided a treed area within the community, they could also use the Collingwood logo. Uh, in conjunction with the CCAT, and you, I'm sure you're aware of that, builders installing heat pumps instead of gas furnaces would likely get approval from CCAT, another plus. Residents, on the other hand, should be encouraged to plant any size tree. Cohen would, would then support resident planting by applying directly a one-time realty tax credit the, on the purchase price up to a given amount. This is debatable. The amount also the purchase price, and the, if Collingwood endorsed the planting of fast-growing trees like oaks, maples, birches, and white pines, among others, by residents and businesses, these credits would be mitigated by the number of trees planted. 
Another first for Collingwood would, would be allowing businesses to sponsor the planting of trees in town-owned spaces and boulevards. Once again, allowing businesses to display the logo on their doors or windows. Collingwood could become a model for other towns. They'll be envious of this of Collingwood because we're doing something nobody else has done. We're moving forward, and they'll try to copy it. I'd like to see things move out the competition, get all the towns working, beautify them, green them. Let's do it. Let's get Collingwood in the forefront of green planting and get people talking and doing something positive. Let's get moving and have the developers on board with Collingwood Green plant for tomorrow. Thank you. If, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Doherty, for your presentation and your passion. Uh, we love trees, too. I believe we have uh, Director uh, Culver online who can speak a little bit to the canopy and, and what we're doing. So if I could ask Director Culver, welcome. Hi. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so again, I appreciate the uh, the deputant's uh, passion for, for trees, and um, we obviously all share the same same passion and are trying to find ways to continually uh, support and enhance the canopy in Collingwood. Um, so there are there are just for to make sure that there that we're working clearly with concepts. Um, that there's a there's a a, a program underway to um, adjust and and affect our what is currently called our tree destruction bylaw. Um, and reframe it uh, as a tree preservation initiative and uh, working with developers um, uh, and uh, and some of the criteria that are going to be required um, when it comes to uh, to large scale development. Um, there's a component about uh, public or sorry private tree uh, planting and and um, private tree destruction as well. Uh, that is all going to be sort of um, evaluated through this process led by SGL consulting. Uh, currently, uh, we're in the process of getting ready to go out to public, um, and Mr. Doherty, we would totally encourage you to be a part of that consultation uh, because um, we'll be looking for public input on um, all of the kind, these kinds of ideas, as well as um, you know what are the the sensitive points that need to be uh, looked after. Um, the other term, uh, other place where we use the term canopy, Collingwood, is to do with um, a program that's uh, provided by a generous donor to the community, and uh, that's where the town provides um, uh, private citizens the opportunity to have a subsidized tree uh, and plant it in their yard. Um, so that canopy Collingwood is um, is something that we administrate, but it is provided for by uh, by Julie De Lorenzo as a donation to the community. Um, it's a separate initiative, but uh, but also one that we're very proud of and very pleased to facilitate on her behalf. Um, so hopefully those two pieces um, help to understand some of the initiatives that we're undertaking to to try and enhance and build on the town's tree tree assets. Uh, thank you, Director Culver, for that. Um, all right. So any other questions or comments around the table? Seeing none. Again, thank you, and I think you've got a. A calling to call to action there <laughs> and participating in the public consultation how, how would i connect with him um we can we can provide maybe we could if you could take your information we will provide oh director culver yeah sorry i i should have mentioned and appreciate the the deputy mentioning it uh we will be uh, going out to the public with a notification of uh use of use of our engaged site as well as um when the public meetings will happen so there'll be lots of notification in the in the uh in the media, but uh, we should also you should also pay attention to the town's website. Okay, so we're going to move now to um, uh, Shelley Wells from Plan Wells Associates uh, with respect to um, her deputation on Panorama North. So welcome, Shelley. Pleased to see you again. Get this set up here. Madam Chair, a familiar face. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Councillors, your worship, town staff, fellow residents, 
For those of you that I haven't met, my name is Shelley Wells from Pan Wells Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Todd, behalf of Ted North for the applications for Panorama North Subdivision. And those applications are for draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment. With me tonight is Alan Brownridge from Atham, familiar face too. And online, uh, we have uh, Trevor Beatty from GHT, GHD Engineers and uh, Pete Graham from um, Ted North. I think they're both online. I wanted to start by talking about the elements of complete communities. And I'm going to apply those elements to the Panorama North uh, subdivision and the surrounding lands. Next slide, please. This slide gives you a bird's eye view of the Panorama North subdivision. It's outlined in red on the, on the map. And so let's take a look at the elements of a complete community as outlined in the growth plan. Are there employment lands? Yes, there are existing industries on the east side of the 10th line. Uh, and Panorama North on the west side of 10th line will establish screening along the entire 10th line frontage. And that screening will uh, consist of three to five meter coniferous trees. So that'll be a solid uh, line of trees along the uh, east line of the Panorama subdivision. Are there diverse residential uses in this area? Yes. Mary Mills subdivision with large estate lots and a few townhouses, the existing uh, Georgian Meadows subdivision, a little bit smaller uh, lots, but uh, exclusively single detached. There also have been three new subdivisions draft plan approved with a diversity of residential types in those subdivisions. That would be Lynx View, Red Maple, and uh, Panorama. Will there be commercial facilities? Yes, there will. In the Panorama subdivision at the corner of 10th Line and Mountain Road, and that would be the southwest corner, there will be a 6,000 square foot neighborhood convenience commercial retail plaza for daily retail needs of the, of the local residents in the area. Is there community infrastructure? Yes. An elementary school is planned for the Lynx View subdivision, and as well, an elementary school is planned for the Panorama North subdivision. Are there parks and recreation facilities? Yes, there are. Fisher Field, as we all know, an existing community park. Neighborhood parks are planned for each of the draft plan approved subdivisions, and Panorama North will also have a neighborhood park. And a portion of that park will be left in its natural state with, with lots of trees. Is there public transit? Yes, there is, but no subways yet. <laughs> There's a, uh, the uh, Blue Mountain bus link uh, stops at Mare Mills today, and that would be along the Mountain Road uh, frontage. And a new bus stop is planned on uh, the same frontage on the Panorama North side of Mountain Road. Is there active transportation infrastructure? Yes, there is. The Black Ash, existing Black Ash Trail connects to the existing Taylor Creek Trail. And then there's a multi-use trail, as you know, that runs along 10th Line between Mountain Road and it connects with the Georgian Trail. Will the little Panorama North connect to these existing trails? Yes, it will. Panorama North will construct a new multi-use trail along the entire frontage, that would be the Mountain Road frontage. And then a new pedestrian trail will be constructed in Panorama North, which connects to the Mountain Road Trail and penetrates through the subdivision um, and connects uh, the residents to the future bus stop on Mountain Road and the existing multi-use trails. What does all this information tell us? It tells us that Panorama North will add to the components of a complete community it, and will be an integral part of a diverse, multi-use, vibrant neighborhood. So let's look a little bit closer at uh, the Panorama North subdivision. Next slide, please. So Panorama North will offer a range of dwelling types and price points. 
And as you can see from this slide, there is a density and dwelling type gradient moving from east to west across the Panorama North subdivision. So that's planner speak for saying that the more dense residential components will be on the east side of the subdivision, and then it will move toward the single family detached dwellings on the west side of the subdivision. Along the uh, 10th line uh, at the north end of the subdivision, uh, the stormwater pond will be located. And then next to that is the planned elementary school site. And then the park is centrally located uh, in the subdivision. These elements create an integrated active public realm. And these three blocks are connected to the internal trail which penetrates Panorama North from Mountain Road. And you can see the internal trail. I hope you can, yeah, I think it shows up on this. Uh, you can see the internal trail. It's a, a brown dotted line. So it starts on Mountain Road, oh, thank you, starts on Mountain Road and goes through the park and then will connect to future development uh, down the road. You can also see the additional green spaces that weave through the site. And then the site, the sidewalks will collect, uh, connect all of these elements. <laughs> Let's look at some of the residential components. On the east side of the site at 10th line, a purpose-built 50-unit rental apartment building will be constructed. Next to that, moving west, will be traditional townhouses and uh, stacked townhouses. And then the townhouses along Mountain Road that are planned along Mountain Road will have rear garages so that these townhouses are therefore street-oriented built forms. So you'll see the front of the house when you drive along Mountain Road. Um, so let's take a look at the individual dwelling types planned for Panorama North. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide again. Thank you. Okay, so... That uh, gives you an idea of some of the uh, types of houses we're planning for Panorama North. So a cohesive architectural treatment is proposed, and the architectural vision will embrace a mountain-inspired built form with West Coast, uh, Mountain Chalet, uh, Victorian Village, and modern farmhouse uh, influences. Only an architect could write that sentence. <laughs> Uh, diverse multiple residential options and tenures will cater to different purchasers, different life cycles, and different price points in Panorama North. And housing attainability is achieved through these more compact, efficient forms. Uh, next slide, please. These are two-story uh, um, single detached homes. And then the next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna spend a minute on these stacked townhouses. They, they're an innovative dwelling type for the ta town of Collingwood. So these stacked townhouses are tar targeted at entry level, first-time home purchasers, um, seniors, uh, folks that are downsizing. So there are four dwelling units in each stacked townhouse. Each dwelling unit is two-bedroom, two-bathroom. So that's the format for all of the dwellings in the stacked townhouse. They all average between 900 and 1,000 square feet, and 100% of them are uh, ground-oriented. So of the four dwellings, um, two of them are single-level um, dwellings, and then the other two uh, have two levels. The bedrooms are upstairs. So instead of entering your home the way you would through an apartment building where you come up an elevator and walk down the hall, each of these stacked townhomes is ground-oriented. Mm -hmm. So they all have uh, entrance from the ground level, and they all have a private outdoor space. Uh, next slide, please. These are some traditional townhouses. Uh, next slide, please. And some concepts of what the apartment building uh, could look like. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just wanted to summarize uh, to say that uh, there are seven important features of Panorama North that I have uh, described for your consideration. 
And I, the bottom feature, I think, is one of the most important. Panorama North is an integral component of a walkable, diverse, multi-use, complete community. Uh, it's going to provide new housing that's efficient, compact, and cost-effective. Diversity in dwelling types, price range, and ownership tenure. And it'll promote active transportation, includes new trails and trail uh, connections. And finally, on behalf of Panorama North and Ted North, I wanted to say we support the planning staff report before you tonight, and we ask that the committee and council approve the Panorama North draft plan of subdivision and the zoning bylaw amendment as set out in your planning staff's report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wells. So I'll look to um, the committee members to see if there's any questions specific to the information that Ms. Wells has provided, because following this will be our staff presentation, then we will go to the public, and then we'll put the motion on for council uh, discussion. But if there's something specific that in terms of uh, information or specifics you need from the Panama North team, we'll do so now. So Councillor Ring and then Councillor Baines. <coughs> Um, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, Chairperson, <laughs> Deputies. Um, through you to um, your presentation, you mentioned about the apartments, the 50-unit apartment building. Um, was there any plans for affordable housing within that unit, or is it all going to be market value? Not to my knowledge. I mean, they'll be efficient. They'll be not large floor plates, but uh, I would say attainable is more the description of the uh, of Purpose built apartment building. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bates. Thank you, Chair Jeffrey. To Ms. Wells, uh, in regard to the possible use of the elementary school, would that be up to uh, obviously the school board to accept it, uh, to build a school? And do you have any idea what their determination would be as to whether or not to build or not? And how long would you expect that land to? be vacant until something happens, either accept or reject it from the school board. Any idea? Good question. Um, yes, it, the, the option is up to the school board as to whether or not they exercise it. And there is a, a timeline that they have after, I think, phase three of Panorama North is built for them to exercise that option or to not exercise it. If they don't exercise it, the site would, uh, that block would become multi-use residential. They, they must think they're going to need el new elementary schools here because they've identified a site, as I mentioned, in Lakesview. And actually, we were quite surprised when they'd identified a second site that they wanted in Panorama North. But as to when they would want to come to market, they haven't really indicated to us that information must be challenging and frustrating to a certain extent uh, thank you all right i think i saw councillor perry and then vice chair doherty uh thank you chair jeffrey um quick question on the the townhouses are they f uh freehold or are they going to be condos the, the stack townhouses um well both yes actually. generally they'll be condominium that the intention is that both the the traditional townhouses and the stacked townhouses will be traditional condominium. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Doherty. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and through you to Ms. Wells, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, when we first saw this uh, proposal, well, more than a year ago now, um, there were proposed more units than what we're looking at today. And I believe that there was also a second apartment building. So uh, what is the reason for that change? You're right. Initially, the application included an official plan amendment. And the initial, you must have been here at the time when I did the public meeting. The initial proposal was for 900 units, and there were more apartment units uh, shown in that uh, original uh, concept plan. It was changed, and we abandoned the official plan amendment application. We just weren't getting a lot of traction on it. And it. Uh, by the time we added in the elements that needed to be added in, the trail connections, the park, the elementary school site, there's also a, a transformer station that will go in here. Um, it just seemed a better subdivision, really. 
uh, at 600 units at this time. The zoning bylaw does permit apartment buildings on some of the other blocks other than the one I mentioned to you because I mentioned that one because my understanding is that it will be purpose-built uh, residential. Thank you. And just to uh, follow up, mm -hmm. the apartment um, specifically, is that a rental or is that a condominium? The one I mentioned that will be right adjacent to 10th line at the yes. corner of Mountain Road, that will be rental apartment. Okay. Purpose-built rental apartment. Excellent. Okay. Thank 50 you. 50 units. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Mayor Hamlin. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering to what extent, if any, there's going to be private road roads built in this community as proposed. Can I have the... Uh, Light plan up again, please. I guess we can't go backwards. <laughs> no. The main roads will be um, municipal roads. And I'm just hoping we can get back. Yes, there we go. So the main roads um, will be municipal roads. Um, and this is a concept plan. So you can see the main east-west road and then the municipal roads through the uh, single detached homes. Uh, there could possibly be private roads in here. Yes, that's uh, a, a, an option that is being looked at. But the main transportation roads will be municipally dedicated. Um, you know, just generally, I don't find those are good types of roads for our community and they leave a lot of future infrastructure burden uh, on probably those of who own homes uh, the least able to you know perform future repairs and maintenance to sewers and uh, pavement and uh, roads <laughs> so I just thought I'd leave that with you and um, one of the big you know, issues I've had with this development is that because it's on the north side of Mountain Road, how are we going to see our pedestrians there and our children uh, if there is the schools located south of Mountain Road? How, how are they going to safely cross? That's a good question uh, because, as you know, the, the intersection at uh, Mountain Road and 10th Line is planned for a roundabout as opposed to lights. The trail I mentioned earlier does penetrate the subdivision down to Mountain Road and it will be very close to where the um, bus stop will be. And it does go right through the Panorama subdivision to the elementary school site. But you're right, there will be, I believe, children living south of Mountain Road that will uh, perhaps go to this elementary school. I'm not a traffic engineer, but I would think that the engineering department uh, uh, will have a good hard look at that to make sure that there is some form of protection for young students crossing up to that elementary school. Yeah, because I would think the cost of that maybe could be a condition of draft approval uh, between your subdivision and the one to the south. I know in a neighborhood I lived in for a number of years in Toronto, uh, the North End, uh, there was a train track, and the school was on the other side of the train track, so there was a quite elaborate, uh, you know, to go up the stairs, across the bridge, <laughs> and down, and it seemed, it was painted in nice colors, seemed to work for that community. Um, so I just, I don't know what the answer is either, but I just know kids are going to have to get from one, one side to the other, wherever the school is, and I, I hope that can be addressed before this uh, gets its final approval. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Doherty, Vice Chair Doherty, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, and actually this is uh, just... Um, um, following up on Mayor Hamlin's comments uh, and through you to uh, either uh, Director Slama or to the CAO, um, the... As best I recall, the improvements on Mountain Road up to 10th Line and incorporating the roundabout also include a very robust um, and protected design for bicycles and for 
uh, pedestrians. So I think it, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to me the last time we saw it, it might be one of the safer intersections um, that we're going to have when it's when it's completed. Okay, we're kind of getting into debate and staff information, so I think we will uh, move into that. Thank you very much, Ms. Wells. So far, I know you're here for the duration of this presentation, so okay. if we need to, we can we will get to you. So now I'll turn it over to Director Valentine to introduce. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So this proposal uh, does represent some long-standing applications that have been in play for quite some time. I think Councillor Doherty estimated a year, but actually they've been in play for about five years. Uh, so what you see before you today does represent quite a bit of diligent work on behalf of the proponent, staff, and the external agencies who might be impacted or advantaged by this development. So we're quite pleased to bring the final product to you this evening for a decision point. Um, in terms of some high-level context, um, as Ms. Mel's, Ms. Wells mentioned, we would note that there is no official plan amendment required to facilitate this development. So what that means is that the proposed density and uses are already contemplated for this site. For your consideration this evening is a draft plan of subdivision and an implementing zoning bylaw amendment. In particular, we would urge you uh, to recall that plans of subdivision have essentially two phases, and we're kind of touching on these points in, in the comments that we've heard around the table. This first phase is draft approval, and it's contemplated today at this juncture. Um, and draft approval lays out the development concept, as you've seen, the lotting fabric, the road structure, infrastructure, active transportation links, phasing, and so on. Um, however, the draft plan approval comes with an extensive list of conditions that as part of the second phase must be fulfilled by the developer uh, before the subdivision can actually be registered and construction would commence. So the owner does have a baseline of three years to address those conditions and enter into an agreement with the town um, around all the technical matters that we've been discussing today. And there is some opportunity for extension of that three-year timeline under certain circumstances. I did also want to assure Council um, from a servicing perspective that this two-phased approach um, to subdivisions is also contemplated in the servicing capacity allocation policy or the SCAP, which is very top of mind for many councillors uh, these days. I think this is one of the first plans of subdivision that you'll see under the revised um, SCAP. So what happens is municipal water and wastewater capacity allocation is committed and accounted for in our tracking tables at this stage, which is the draft approval, and that's why you'll see the SCAP evaluation appended. But importantly, the timing of that allocation, meaning the year that that capacity actually gets allocated to this property, remains completely under the town's control. So as we've heard, there are a number of years that the developer has um, to bring this uh, product to, to shovel readiness. And what the SCAP allows us to do is ensure that we're not tying up that capacity now. We're accounting for it, but the year that it becomes available is at the town's discretion and based on the SCAP score. So the other servicing nuance uh, that we wanted to highlight with this development, and Ms. Mel Ms. Wells mentioned that there's three other draft approved plans of subdivision, and they're all located at the west end of town. So to move forward to construction, these sites not only require capacity in the water and wastewater plants, but also some significant linear infrastructure upgrades. Um, what we have uh, determined in consultation with our engineering colleagues is that those necessary linear upgrades will happen at earliest concurrently with our water treatment plant upgrades. So you will notice that there is a condition in the draft approval concept before you that indicates that uh, the timing of that municipal water and wastewater allocation would only be available at the earliest upon the completion of our waste water, uh, waste, uh, excuse me, our water treatment plant upgrades. So overall, the approvals before you today would put this project at the same status as the other three West End draft plans of subdivision. And it would also help to facilitate negotiation with the town and those proponents on an early payment agreement for the provision of that linear infrastructure to this part of town. So I think maybe I've perhaps uh, encroached a bit on senior planner Brian's presentation, but with servicing uh, such a key uh, issue for the town, I did think that those uh, comments would be helpful. 
And uh, at your concurrence, Madam Chair, we would be prepared to move to Senior Planner's, uh, Senior uh, Planner's presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Senior Planner Brian, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Chair Jeffrey. Um, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor. I'm Chair Jeffrey, members of council, members of the public. Um, I'm going to try to shorten this presentation a little bit, um, if I can. Slide, please. Um, here's the subject uh, property. We've seen it before. It's 20 hectares in size. And I'm just going to add a couple of things that uh, uh, I'm not sure that Ms. Wells um, picked up on. And one is that about 300 meters to the north, we do have the county landfill. And that's an important uh, aspect of the area. And we do have those industrial uses to the east. Uh, tenth line, everything else being either draft approved residential plans, a subdivision, existing residences, or um, residential areas, or lands that are designated for future residential development. Next slide, please. Um, these development uh, applications have been subject to in depth review over the past five and a half years, starting with pre consultation. Um, in the late fall of 2017, and then they were followed up with applications in December 2018. And as noted, they were originally for an official plan uh, amendment, a zoning bylaw amendment, and a proposed plan of subdivision. The applications were deemed complete on December 20th, 2018, and proceeded to the public meeting on April 29th, 2019. The proposed development has been subject to um, the subject of multiple submissions and technical review by the town's departments. Um, external agencies and third party peer reviewers, and that has led to the zoning bylaw amendment, draft plan of subdivision, and conditions that uh, are now before committee. Next slide, please. A little background on uh, the official plan um, the lands are designated for residential uses, they are designated for the densities that have been requested. Uh, the density range is 20 to 30 units per hectare. It includes all of the residential unit, um, unit types uh, requested. Uh, so 20 to 30 units per hectare, they are coming in at 30 units per hectare. And of course, the development lands are also well located in respect of the town's built boundary and the existing built up areas. Next slide, please. Just a quick comment on zoning. There is zoning in place on the property right now for second density and third density residential uses. This reflects an old plan of subdivision that was closed um, over a decade ago. So we see residential areas, we see a local convenience block right at the corner of where the roundabout will be located, and we see some parkland. But as Ms. Wells pointed out, there is a local convenience block immediately to the south in the draft approved Mayor Mills Villages or now Panorama subdivision. Um, there is a holding provision that's applicable to these properties and that's in respect to the landfill to the north and that is so that any impacts of the landfill on this residential, residential development are appropriately addressed to the satisfaction of the county. Next slide please. So the proposed zoning proposes a number of residential third density zones that reflect the various uses that um, Ms. Wells pointed out um, with the generally capturing that gradient of higher densities to the south and east of the development and then generally falling off as you move to the north and west. There are a number of exceptions to these zones and generally these exceptions are directed at um, the higher density dwelling types closer to Mountain Road and the 10th line intersection. And they are also in place to ensure good urban design, especially in terms of achieving attractive and activated streetscapes. So that this is where provisions come into effect um, that prevent or prohibit parking onto the public streets um, for those multi-residential blocks. And there's also a bit of wiggle room with the setbacks to try to have some staggered setbacks for the townhouses that would front onto Mountain Road or onto that main east-west street A. And as noted, uh, the zoning also introduced stack, introduces stacked townhouses as a more specific type of townhouse. And uh, stacked townhouses generally have um, characteristics that are more in keeping with apartment buildings low-rise apartment buildings. 
Um, we've added um, a number of holding provisions to address, um, for one, the um, county landfill to the north, um, then as well as um, uh, site uh, cleanup of site contamination on the eastern portion of the property where there was historically an apple orchard, confirmation of service and capacity allocation, and on that H25 CS10 block, which is the elementary school, we have a holding provision there to help ensure that it remains for an elementary school until such time as the school board decides that they don't need it. Next slide, please. Um, we'll skip this slide too. Okay, so here's the actual plan of subdivision. It contains 126 single detached dwellings. Um, 124 lots are shown there. There is one block that would be used for future um, single detached dwellings. Uh, when the street, um, I think it's street B, if it were to punch through to the west. The multi-residential blocks. Five multi-unit residential blocks. One apartment block as noted, that's block 130 right at the corner of uh, 10th line and Mountain Road. One block for the elementary school, the park block, um, a sort of diagonal shaped uh, trail block that uh, goes from Mountain Road into the site towards the park. One block for a hydro substation and lands for public streets. Next slide, please. This is the slide that Ms. Wells presented earlier. It does show 126 single detached dwellings, 102 two-story townhouses, 80 townhouses which would have rear garages so that um, they would actually they would front onto Mountain Road and Street A primarily, but their driveways, um, garages would be internal to the site. That's for um, streetscape. Uh, 92 stacked townhouses, 50 apartments, and the elementary school. And uh, one thing that I'd like to note here um, is that these multi-use or multi-unit residential blocks are all planned to be developed as condominiums with an internal um, um, road system um, that on this development concept is shown as having a very high degree of connectivity. So there are different blocks, but um, and uh, we also see some open space green areas and some active transportation trails throughout this. And um, um, one of the um, one of the draft plan conditions requires that the development of these various blocks be done in an integrated manner with easements and access for the general public to be able to use the open space and active transportation system within these condo developments. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, our technical analysis, this slide just lists off the various major reports, studies that were submitted and um, which were reviewed by um, town departments and um, applicable third party peer reviewers, and uh, of course, external commenting agencies such as the Conservation Authority. Next slide, please. Um, as noted, to ensure that the proposed development proceeds as intended and in accordance with the technical review, the draft approved plan of subdivision is accompanied by a set of draft plan conditions. The conditions would each need to be fulfilled by the applicant to the satisfaction of the town or other authority with jurisdiction prior to or through future subdivision agreements. And I say agreements because as we've heard, this development will need to be phased in order to address service and capacity allocation and um, um, also as per the developer's general intentions to proceed in a phased manner. The conditions propo proposed are the outcome of staff efforts are also the outcome of staff efforts to make the town's standard conditions um, simpler and clearer um, and easier to use in the future when um, it comes time to look at plan registration. Major issues addressed through the draft plan conditions include service and capacity allocation and phasing of the subdivision, compatibility with the county landfill and uh, the adjacent industrial areas, 
urban and architectural design, parkland and active transportation, the integration of the multi-residential blocks, site remediation, and transportation and traffic calming. And the uh, lapse date proposed for this draft approval would be um, provided that it goes forward on uh, June 5th to Council, then it would be June 5th, 2026. Uh, Ms. Wells presented um, a basic summary of, of uh, what's good about the development. I'll just add a, a couple of uh, points to that. Um, the first one would be that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan for the development, uh, they are consistent and conform with the applicable provincial and municipal planning policy and regulatory framework. The subject applications were circulated to town departments, applicable third-party peer reviewers and external commenting agencies for review and comment, and all matters have been sufficiently addressed. And um, the development also helps to advance uh, needed water and wastewater servicing infrastructure, road and active transportation, and community services with a potential school. Next slide, please. Summary, the applications have been subject to five years of extensive review. The approvals before Council represent the compiled efforts of the proponents, staff and agency partners. Public input and consideration of the community has been considered and addressed. Development proposal constitutes good planning with the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision conforming to the town's official plan. And our next steps at this point would be that um, Council decisions regarding the applications will require notification as per the Planning Act. The draft plan approval leads to additional applications and future considerations. And uh, the satisfaction of draft plan conditions and final approvals of plans which are required and intended to be in phases. Um, the, um, uh, the timing of municipal servicing allocation and um, some of the other future um, matters to be uh, considered would include site plan control approvals, so site plan applications for the multi-residential blocks and um, additional um, applications such that um, if they're proceeding with um, condominium registrations and so forth, then they may apply for condominium exemptions, which is technicality to, to help with the creation of the tenure. And I'll say that that concludes planning services presentation. Thank you very much for all of that information, Senior Planner Brian. Um, uh, so I think what we'll do is go to the public portion right now. And um, I thought there was a gentleman here earlier who had asked specifically about Panorama North. Is there anyone in the gallery wishing to speak? Okay. Uh, so Clerk Almas will just ask you to check online. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Jeffrey. Any participants partic uh, participating in this meeting remotely that would like to address the staff report, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And there's not this time. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so what I will do is read the motion and uh, then we can uh, proceed with your uh, questions and comments. Uh, that staff report P2023-15, draft approval of plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment 295 Mountain Road, Panorama North, dated May 15th, 2023, be received. And that the draft plan of subdivision, file number D120-1318, Panorama North, dated February 3rd, 2023, and attached as Appendix A, be approved. And that the zoning bylaw amendment attached as Appendix C to report P2023-15 to facilitate the implementation of the Panorama Panorama North plan of subdivision be enacted and passed. Have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Potts and Councillor Perry. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, Councillor Houston. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, um, <laughs> but uh, in reading the, um, the staff report, it makes six mentions of affordable housing, including comments of contributing to the town's goals of affordable housing and providing adequate provision of a full range of housing, including affordable housing. Um, and I believe the proponent uh, when asked mentioned that there, there were no provisions for affordable housing in this development. Um, given that there are 600 units proposed to this, I guess my, my comment is that I, I am challenged to support something like this um, when it's not not 
contributing to the mentions of affordable housing, which are in the report. Maybe ask uh, staff to respond to um, the intention of their wording in the report. Senior planner, you want to? Yeah. Um, oh. um, through through you, Madam Chair, to um, Councillor Houston. Um, it's generally been recognized that with higher density development, with higher density dwelling types, such as stacked townhouses or apartments, there is a greater probability that you will achieve affordable housing. So it's within that broader context that affordability is put out there. But I understand that um, we are in the process of, of moving to um, supporting projects that have a much more um, clearly defined um, consideration of affordability, but it's generally that the higher density dwelling types are more affordable options as compared to the lower density that we've often seen in the past. Um, I guess just a question for the proponent then would be, uh, would given this, would there be any consideration then into converting some of these uh, into affordable housing? Uh, I'm going to go, uh, Director Valentine is asking to speak, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just further to the comments of Senior Planner Brian, and before you move to Ms. Wells, if that is appropriate at this time, um, you know, the councillors hit on something that is very challenging for planning staff. You see the word affordable housing woven into the provincial policy statement, and we do uh, repeat the provincial policy statement verbatim, so you do see that wording included. Unfortunately, as we've discussed a number of times, the province has not provided our municipality and many others across, uh, across Ontario with an effective tool to require affordable housing. So without that inclusionary zoning uh, piece, uh, the senior planner is quite right. We can only look at uh, affordability through the lens of a variety of housing uh, types, a variety of housing styles, uh, sizes, excuse me, and uh, and tenure options for our community. So we do have that language. The province asks us to take that into account, but with limited tools, uh, we've worked with the proponent to the extent possible at this point to encourage as much affordability and attainability as we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for that response. Um All right, so thank you. So I think uh, it won't be appropriate to have the proponent come up at this point uh, in our discussion, but I think what you could ask is that staff continue to pursue uh, the goal of uh, the more affordable housing as we understand it to be for us, and, and they'll do their best going forward. Yeah, absolutely, and recognizing that, that we can't require affordable housing, but um, putting it out there that we would appreciate it. Okay, all right, good, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Doherty. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. So I just I have uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, generally, I'm I'm very supportive of this proposal um, as best we can. Uh, we are able to get a, a variety of housing types that hopefully are going to affect the price. Uh, and it's also um, very gratifying to see that there is a rental component because more than affordable to purchase housing, we need rental stock. Um, so it's a tr tremendous to see that. And uh, if by any chance um, the school board does not go forward with a school on site, it would be wonderful to see rental housing on that site as well. Um, my comments um, mostly am, um, have to do with uh, the design of the, um, the streets. Uh, and um, the first comment that I will make is that um, Street A, uh, which is a long, presumably wide, straight street, uh, is, um, I'm, I'm afraid, is going to lead us to the same problems that we're having today with Finley Street, which is a long, straight street connecting two developments, and Portland Street. And the issue is safety, uh, speed. Um, so it would be, in my view, um, so much better uh, from a traffic 
calming traffic safety standpoint to see uh, more curvilinear uh, streets that just naturally tend to slow traffic down. Um, but I also do note um, that there is reference uh, in this report to traffic calming elements, and I'm just wondering if I can ask uh, through you to the proponent what specifically you had intended with those. Are, are staff able Eight. to, I, I would look to Director Valentine to please uh, outline that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you, and I, I can start, and Senior Planner Brian can certainly um, add in. So um, there is a condition of, of uh, draft approval that does require traffic calming to be implemented throughout the plan of subdivision, so that's part of the detailed technical piece that comes next. Um, staff are, again, challenged because we need to try to balance a number of different priorities of the town. And curvilinear streets, um, though uh, potentially appropriate from a traffic calming and safety perspective, are the most challenging from a climate change and efficient use of land and services um, standpoint. So um, we've tried, again, like I mentioned, to, to balance the needs for traffic calming as part of a review of the detailed road, um, uh, sorry, word road, uh, Alignment and, uh, oh goodness, uh, yes, cross section. Cross section, thank you, uh, as part of the detailed technical review, but also to maintain that modified grid structure that we know is the most efficient from a uh, climate change and efficient use of land and services perspective. Okay, thank you, Director Valentine. And Senior Planner, nothing to add to that? Um, actually, um, Madam Chair, I do have a couple of things to add to that. One is that um, in the applicant's urban design guidelines, um, they do place particular emphasis on active transportation and they specifically identify Street A as needing investigation for traffic calming and including consideration of potentially small traffic circles and curb extensions or stop controls at the Street A intersections with Streets B and C. And while I don't purport to be a traffic engineer, um, I do note that this street does have a um, a, a grade change to it, um, just like Mountain Road does. And uh, that that means that when you're coming in off of uh, 10th line, you're not going to be able to, um, I'm envisioning that you won't be able to see right to the end of the street. You'll only be able to see as far as that slope change point, which may have a traffic calming effect as well, okay. but not a traffic engineer. Right, <laughs> but thank you for the for the contributions and additions. I know, no, we appreciate uh, follow up. Are you okay to that point? Uh, yeah, Bishop? no, thank you. That was great. Um, the uh, the condominium elements um, are those just the roads? Or is that the intention that it's just the roads that are condominium elements? Shared elements, senior planner. Um, through the chair to Councillor Doherty, um, the the um, um, planning consultant here tonight has described that the multi residential blocks are intended to proceed by plan of condominium. So that means that the the um, all of the areas of the development would be part of the con the would be part of the the condominium. Um, the roads, the common areas, the parking areas, there might be an exclusive use area for a townhouse, but they would the townhouses themselves would not be separate lots in association with a common element condominium. Thank you. Um, just as a follow-up, uh, because I'm very much uh, in agreement with um, Mayor Hamlin's comments with regard to um, the cost of um, ongoing maintenance for condominiums. So while the initial purchase uh, may wind up being less, uh, the ongoing fees may still make uh, that type of housing unaffordable. Uh, and I will follow up further that with um, the thought that um, if it were possible to for the town to um, have control of all roads, including those roads that would be um, accessing the the condominium blocks, um, even though they would be narrower, 
would there be an opportunity for us um, to consider the notion of narrower roads that are assumed by the municipality, narrower than what we generally use right now? Senior planner? I, um, through the chair, um, I think that would be something that we'd mm -hmm. have to um, talk to engineering services about in terms of what our acceptable standards um, and if that's um, that's something that we would be would we would even consider because at this point um, these would all be matters for the condominium development rather than the municipality okay. um, I would just add um, I certainly hear the concern over um, future condominiums and whatnot and that is in part reflected in the draft plan conditions that deal with the multi-use residential blocks, the desire to integrate them to make them work for the community rather than just the immediate condominium area. We also have several draft plan conditions that deal with future condominiums, and these uh, contain warning clauses and, and um, direction to alert purchasers of potential costs associated with um, being in a condominium situation. Uh, these are some of the changes that arose, I believe, back in September 2020, when um, uh, then Director Farr brought forward a report that dealt with um, how to address some of these concerns over private roads. Okay. All right, thank you. I have Councillor Ring and then Deputy Mayor, unless yours was specific to something, Councillor Doherty, no? You're okay. Yeah, I just have um, one more comment. Um, actually, it's two quick ones. Um, it, with regard to the notion of constructing affordable housing um, where we have limited tools, um, another thought uh, for some proportion of the housing, particularly the single family, uh, would be the notion of purpose-built accessory units. Um, perhaps uh, finished basement granny suite so that uh, while the price of the home may be a little bit higher, um, the amount of uh, rent that may be taken in could certainly offset the mortgage payments for a young family. And then I was also pleased to see, and I hope that it will come to pass, um, that the uh, stormwater management pond uh, will be naturalized. Um, through the chair to Councillor Doherty, um, in the SCAP evaluation that was undertaken for this development, um, the developer did, um, um, did indicate um, that they would um, do rough-ins for accessory dwelling units within um, a, the majority of the single detached dwellings. Um, I look to the applicant's planning consultant to confirm that. So that was that was, and that was one of the uh, avenues that they chose in terms of getting SCAP points. Um, and uh, second part, with respect to the stormwater management pond, there is a draft plan condition that requires the stormwater management pond to be constructed in a in a naturalized um, state and um, to the greatest extent possible an unfenced condition. Yeah, that's great um, because what we see in the Riverside development is just absolutely the best treatment of stormwater management pond I think that I've ever seen and I know that the residents love it. Um, so Thank you okay. for your deference. Those were my questions and comments. <laughs> All right, they're excellent. And just for learning, you were a little bit over the five minutes, but we we allowed you to go over rather than going around the table and coming back. All right, Councillor Ring. Thank you very much, Chair Jeffrey. Um, through you to, I guess, uh, any staff, town staff, when we're doing uh, staff reports that are presented to Council, uh, like, like uh, Councillor Houston, when I read this report, I read affordable housing so many times. I, my definition of affordable housing is 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 different than what was just explained. I'm not going to debate now that I've heard what it really means. Just wondering if there's a better way of describing the housing because, as far as I'm concerned, when we talk about it, uh, trying to obtain or get more affordable housing, 
in, in the municipality. I'm looking at uh, mid to low income families that can afford it, and, and and I'm not seeing that here. Mm-hmm. That just means what they're calling affordable housing is something that's more affordable than most expensive housing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. not it's not going to serve a lot of our needs, and and that's I just wish that we would call it affordable housing because that. If, if uh, Councillor Houston hadn't asked the question, I, I had a totally different definition of what the reference affordable housing means in this report. And, and uh, I think uh, just for clarity better, maybe mm-hmm. I'm the only one that thought that, but I, uh, yeah. I just, uh, when you use affordable housing, I'm thinking of a little different thing that we're, than what's ex- explained here. Mm-hmm. So understanding staff's requirement to um, refer to the, um, I'm going to say legislation, the plan, the planning act, and the things that they have to follow. Now, I don't think they can change that wording when they're reporting to us, but maybe what they could do is a qualifying paragraph specific to uh, our understanding of affordable housing and and the efforts that are being made toward that. Would that be helpful? Impossible. Valentine is nodding, so that's great. Just a quick follow-up. I, I understand that we can't do any inclusionary mm-hmm. bylaws. I mean, mm-hmm. we don't. Our hands are tied. I just thought when I read the affordable housing, and it was, I had one off the top of my head. One one reference said uh, number of different housing units, including affordable housing. I thought, okay, now that's what I like, but that's not really what was explained when when uh, they def- asked for the definition of affordable housing. And I think staff can make that clear and have agreed to make that clearer for us going forward uh, within each uh, proposal um, of the differentia- differentiation between them. All right, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I thought some of the slides you had in your staff um, uh, presentation were, were helpful because I was thinking about the south side of the property and didn't really know for sure what it was going to look like. At least there's some some uh, information for the the south panorama um, because I share the same concerns as uh, Mayor Hamlin in regards to pedestrian movement and and uh, what's going to be a very very busy intersection. So I know I know staff will be looking at that uh, fairly extensively. Um, in regards to the roadway structure in it, um, I just wanted to ask, in your opinion. Are there going to be any barriers to um, either waste management by Simcoe County or snow plowing um, of the entire site? Through the chair to um, Deputy Mayor Fryer, um, during the site plan approval stage, the county would have to look at site plan proposals to determine whether um, there'd be any imped- any impediments to use of their services for waste collection. Um, typically, we when we are dealing with condominium developments of this nature, the responsibility to provide waste collection is on the the, the developer, um, and they can approach the county to ensure that the road pattern is properly constructed to allow for their services. If they can't, then they would have to find um, private providers for waste collection. Um, uh, it is something that's on my radar, and I know uh, currently the counties trying to deal with these situations where they've got areas that they're not able to um, uh, have some of their programs, like the compost program and diversion program. Um, so, so it's it's something that uh, that would be coming at a later stage. Um, I, I noticed on page seven, um, it talks about the water servicing commitment, and I was really pleased to to hear the um, uh, confirmation that uh, um, it's totally at the discretion of um, the timing of the water allocation and remains solely at the municipality level, um, and uh, and it won't it isn't anticipated to happen until after the plant's expanded. On page 22, it talks about extensive extensions to the works for Stewart Road Booster Facility and the trunk main along 10th line. So is this going to require a front-end loading agreement? Because it also makes a comment about uh, early payment anticipated to expedite work. So I just kind of wondered how that all tied together and if there was going to be a front-end loading agreement in this. Um, I think I would, um, through the chair, I would... Dr. Slama? Director Slama, if you could report. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Deputy Mayor Fryer, yes. Um, the works that would involve uh, the Stewart Road Reservoir and Booster Station and 10th Line Trunk Water Main, uh, we've been talking with uh, developers that um, have their draft plan approval already, as well as Panorama North, um, and entering into what we're calling an early payment agreement. <laughs> Just if I if I may, then um, the other uh, note I was going to speak to was I, I I see the extensive conditions that are outlined in the report that have to be made or met before it can proceed. So I, I'm I do support the uh, support it going forward. But what I noted on page 36 was it made reference to that there be no further public meeting required, as the concerns that had been raised to date had 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 basically been addressed. So. I just wanted to ask if there was anything that we've heard today that would change that outlook as far as whether or not there would be a need for another public meeting session. All right. Director Valentine, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, uh, you'll note that in the staff report, we didn't at this time recommend another public meeting because the issues that were raised um, at the uh, initial meeting were addressed uh, through uh, the the submissions and the redesign of the subdivision as well as through the conditions of draft approval. We didn't have any public comment here this evening and um, okay. hopefully we've been able to address the councillors uh, questions and concerns to a level that is to your satisfaction at this point in the process with the understanding that there are future applications uh, to come forward. Um, but you know that would be our recommendation at, at this time and recognizing that this has been five years in the works but um, you as council could always defer if you hear something today that you felt would require a second public meeting and just a final thing then is that uh, that's why i wanted to ask that question because i continue to support staff's recommendation that there doesn't need to be another public uh, meeting session but i thought it was important that we stated that publicly um, there still is a two-week period before we actually have it come to formal council so if anybody wanted to put some comments in, we'd still be able to receive them on that consent agenda. So mm -hmm. I just thought it was important to uh, to note that publicly. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mayor Evelyn. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I was wondering if Director Salama could address the safe pedestrian crossing of Mountain. Thank you. Director Salama. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair, to Mayor Hamlin. Yeah, so I was able to pull up the uh, design for the, the mountain road and the roundabout uh, intersection. And so there, as you uh, may recall, there will be a sidewalk and a multi-use trail uh, as part of the road reconstruction for both mountain road and 10th line. One side will be a sidewalk, the other side will be the multi-use trail. And then the roundabout uh, design has incorporated uh, pedestrian crossings. So we've got uh, pedestrian markers with um, signage. Um, I believe that would still be termed an unprotected crossing because it won't be signalized like a pedestrian wouldn't push a button. Um, and all of the, um, the road connections have islands. Uh, so there is um, a pedestrian could cross one lane and then rest or stage themselves on the island uh, to continue uh, to continue through if that was required as well. And would that be a recommended crossing for children on through the islands on the islands? Uh, th that would be that is what's proposed for all pedestrians. So, so crossing each road, um, and then there's a resting area on uh, the island and the road. Actually, on the site plan uh, that a senior planner, Brian, had up, we could kind of see the little islands on the roundabout. And just as a follow-up to Director Slama, um, I can, when I look at this, what I'm picturing in the fullness of time is a lit pedestrian crossing halfway through the block. <laughs> and... Um, I'm just wondering uh, whether that should be a condition like contribution to cost now. And I'm just, yeah, sorry, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, Director Slama? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, 
uh, to uh, Mayor Hamlin. So at this time, uh, we we know what the density is proposed for this development, but we don't know for sure whether there will be a school or where the school will be located on this west end of town. So it's possible, but we, we might see crossings happening either way. So your... So are, so I apologize. Could you repeat repeat your request? You want us to look at uh, whether there should be a condition for a contribution to, to a, a future a, pedestrian okay. elite crossing mid block. And you can mm -hmm. obviously just if yeah. you could report back at the next and, meeting and uh, discuss with engineering. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my second question is: um, I've heard, and I'm sure all of council does. We. We hear from people who are in these uh, townhouse condominium developments and the problems we're ha they're having with them. And so these aren't the people who come out to public meetings because they're already in their homes. <laughs> um, but I, I know some of them, um, you know, some of the issues is I, I see that we're developing into a community or a town with innumerable public, uh, private roads, innumerable need for private garbage pickup, innumerable need for private snow removal, and there aren't even enough uh, operators of private snow removal or garbage removal to serve everybody. And what I'm hearing is there's not even a place to put the snow, even if you can find a truck <laughs> and a guy with the truck. <laughs> like, there's not sufficient places for the snow to go. So my question through you, Madam Chair, to staff is, how are we going to address this in this development, all these needs the future residents will have uh, to have help with their private services? Uh, CEO Skinner would like to respond. Um, thank you through the chair. Uh, this is really uh, getting at the nub of the area that uh, that council would take leadership within and um, in bringing forward the the development standards or other rules that would apply to all developments as we move forward. So we are we are hearing trends of this of this nature. Uh, I know that there are some development standard updates or the engineering development standards are, are in flight for an, an update back to council. And um, this would you know, be the type of item where you may wish to, mm -hmm. uh, to ask staff to report back around um, <coughs> what should be tackled in what order, for example, um, so that we set the provisions pr appropriately for future developments that come forward um, in Collingwood that we could avoid these uh, these types of concerns or at least have fully vetted whether and you know they are concerns and, and how strong they might be as we move forward okay. all right um, um, because to mayor Hamlin's point too I know there's a lot of other developments along the uh, tenth line that have school properties on hold and uh, I know the last term of council we had asked the school board to maybe attend to ask the school boards to come to call or to come to calling with council and advise us as to their plans and how many properties they expected developers to hold while we're trying to plan for uh, complete communities, not really knowing where the school was going to end up. So how do you start to make plans for pedestrian crossings when we're not even sure where that school is going to go? So that was kind of the concerns from the last uh, presentations that we talked about. All right, and so you have another... Uh, One more. Yeah. And I'll just say on the school sites, I think school boards tend to reserve all the sites they can and then the first development that comes forward they're going to put the school in and the rest will fill in but anyway that's what my thought on it my last question is um, what I hear about people who live in the shipyards and there's apparently innumerable condominium corporations in there and the site is replete with easements between the condominium corporations uh, is that they don't often make sense and um, they're struggling as condominium corporations uh, with how to deal with these easements because you need 100% approval of the condo board before you can change anything and that's almost always impossible. So one owner I spoke to in there in the last year, you know, he really had urged me to have the town take a sort of a proactive overarching look at these types of developments to make sure that the easements will all work if they are all going to be condominium developments. So my question through you, Madam Chair, is, is there an opportunity um, in, in this planning process to make sure that this kind of overview would take place? Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Director Valentine. Uh, thank you through you, Madam Chair. I wasn't sure if Senior Planner Brian was going to chime in, but oh, uh, as indicated, we do we do have a condition of draft approval that requires a comprehensive development of those condominium blocks or the multi-residential uh, blocks so that we can use that in effect to look at those easements uh, in a more detailed way than we have in the past. Um, I would also suggest another opportunity available to council is through the official plan review. Um, certainly we've seen sort of private roads off private roads off private roads and we've and we've been challenged with that type of uh, planning or uh, vestiges of, of older planning uh, policies, but we can uh, certainly look at requiring condominiums to have access off of a uh, Town owned uh, year round maintained road. So, uh, and, and this would be the case in Panorama North that each of the corporations would have access off of the, uh, the, the public road system, although they may also have connectivity between themselves. Uh, so, it's just another thing to keep top of mind as we move forward with the official plan review because at this time there's limited tools. Condominiums are, uh, are uh, legislatively, any applicant can apply for them. We can't necessarily. Uh, stop an application from happening, but as the CEO mentored, we can put standards in place and policies in place to ensure that we are using this tool in the right place for our community. Okay, thank you. I have <laughs> Councillor Perry and then Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Chair Jeffrey. And uh, just to further uh, Mayor Hamlin's comments, um, with the development that's coming down 10th line, um, whether there's a school or not there, I know it's going to be a very extremely busy uh, trail section running up to uh, because you can access the Georgian Trail from from Tenth Line. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love roundabouts. If I was planning a town, there'd be no streetlights in a town right now. But that's going to be an extremely busy intersection, and uh, I'm very concerned, school or not, very concerned. Um, with a safe crossing there. In particular, I've lived, or not lived, but experienced an intersection like that, trying to get across in Quebec one time, and it was, put it bluntly, it was a nightmare in, in, in rush hour. So I'm sure Friday afternoons on, on weekends is going to be pretty difficult to get across there. Whether there are islands or not to stand on, it's going to be very difficult to get through there. Okay, we we maybe have some statistics from some other roundabouts. I know Town of Blue Mountain says their big one at the base of the hill, which all the pedestrian crossings done through that, and a pretty busy standard. And I know Hume Street, uh, that crossing helped us putting that lane in, in the middle there to get people yeah. crossing one lane at a time. Right. So we can bring all those into consideration. So your points are taken. Councillor Baines? Uh, thank you, Chair Jeffrey. I'd just like to say a political responses. I agree practically with everyone, but... Having said that, uh, particularly in regard to the crossing, uh, if there are school children there too, but I would put it to you that that's the town's issue, not the developer's issue. Likewise, about closing the barn door in regard to uh, condos and the rules of operations that they have to live under, I, again, I would put it to you, perhaps it's the town slash province's issue. But for this application at this point, after five years of the process that we've gone through with the planners in this. I'm quite satisfied with the way it's presented to us at this point and uh, in support of proceeding with this as it is now. Having said that, we certainly have to deal with this issue of the roundabout and or should a school come, uh, lights, <laughs> I don't know, something to get those kids across there safely. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think everyone's uh, had some input. Uh, anyone, Councillor Potts, you're okay? Everything's, everybody's covered it. All right, that's great. Yes, what, what happened with your invitation to the school board to come and talk to us about? Uh, never heard from them, or never. I don't know whether staff delivered it or not. I just never heard a report back either way. I suspect the invitation went out, and they never took the opportunity. That's my. I suspect. Um, to, <clears throat> to the chair, that is correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Because <laughs> I knew our staff would never not do it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. So I'm going to take the liberty as chair of severing out. So we're all going to vote on firstly on receiving uh, the staff report. So all those in favor of receiving set out in appendix A's and C. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is noted. Thank you. 
Right. Thank you, everyone, for your input on that. So that's going to take us back to uh, 6.4, and the CAO is going to uh, update us uh, on the operational plan and the quarter one progress report. Yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have a short deck, uh, well, 11 slides, to, uh, to briefly walk you through. Um, I wanted to thank Shelby Verkant and the department heads who made the uh, process possible uh, and to make sure that we do have these quarterly updates that show uh, council and the public uh, where a number of our operational and strategic items are, are sitting. Yeah, next slide. Um, we have uh, a couple of positional slides as this is the first quarterly update we've had with this term of council. Uh, so in uh, 2020, we had an update of our community-based uh, uh, vision, and uh, you can see it online, and for convenience, it's here on the slide. And it's what we work toward in all of our projects is to, over the next 10-plus uh, years, to, to reach our vision. And uh, there's a number of different things that, on the next slide, it shows that we work through um, uh, so that you could explain them to someone who, uh, you know, stopped you outside the pool and wanted to talk about where the town is going. So we have our vision is where we're going. And the vision has in the darkest uh, sl uh, boxes at the top where, where we want to end up as a town. We want to be a hub of successful entrepreneurs. We want a strong cultural and built heritage and an inclusive community. That's what we're working toward. Um, and in order to get there, uh, the next section down is the strategic plan objectives in the mid green, if you're not colorblind. <laughs> and uh, those are uh, the things that we're most trying to transform. So these were set by the last council and the person outside the pool will probably ask you about managing growth and condo, condo roads and those kind of things and how we, how we move forward. So there's five of those that, uh, that we work on and there's always a number of very important and we hope funded a strategic plan uh, transformations that are underway. Under that, in the lighter green, um, uh, the, there's our programs and services, which basically are everything that we're doing, all of the ongoing work. It may be plowing streets. It may be just continuous improvement to our, to our current uh, uh, programs and services internally and externally. And there's a few pieces that uh, fall below that uh, that are also important that we haven't quite finished yet, things like key performance indicators, um, uh, Chair Jeffrey, uh, from uh, chair of this committee, uh, mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier today a uh, notice of motion related to s uh, sustainable development goals and the types of things that we might want to set as goals uh, for our own strategic plan. So those would still be under development. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is another way to sort of look at the same thing, but I'm going to use it for a slightly different purpose. Um, there's the vision at the very top that we're trying to achieve, and we have a small number of strategic transformations that uh, council identifies, uh, typically each term with public input. We then have the delivery of a larger suite of all the town programs and services. And then individual staff deliver what they've been tasked to deliver under their annual performance plans. And then ultimately, uh, the community experiences those many, many touch points, whether it's getting your swimming lesson or you're getting your road plowed or you're um, maybe getting an event permit. All of those things collectively add up uh, to us having a better and better community. And then hopefully the corporate performance reporting and the feedback from staff and council help us to understand how close we're getting to our vision. Uh, so that's where I'm going to link us to the uh, annual operational plan. So all of the strategic transformations and those that delivery of uh, town programs and services, we try to capture many of those in our operational plan. On the next slide, the framework, uh, this is what we try to capture on the operational plan. If it's a council resolution that requires action by staff, if it has a significant mention in the budget, including our capital projects, if we'll need to go to council for a decision, so it's a policy or strategy or an item that hasn't been uh, uh, had a delegation of authority to staff, or if it's a project that as a rule of thumb takes roughly over three person weeks of time, we try to capture it in this plan. So what's out of scope you won't see here is ongoing routine service delivery items, day-to-day -day activities, um, issuing a, uh, a, a death certificate, the documentation or a marriage license or plowing the street is not in this plan. 
And there's a number of items that are tracked elsewhere, very specifically things like development applications that we keep a separate, separate uh, uh, running tally of. And uh, just as a quick reminder, this plan is all about collaboration. It's not about um, knocking people over the head because they haven't gotten something done quite on time. Uh, it's about talking to each other. Every manager has uh, full access to the plan and can update their items. So once the budget is set, um, um, uh, we, uh, we set the timeframes. Uh, we mention who needs to be involved. We have things like which departments that are corporate services, like purchasing, for example, or fleet uh, would need to, or IT that needs to be engaged. It helps us make sure that if council mentions something, uh, or staff mentioned something that needs to be done in a future year, we don't lose track of it. So tonight we talked about um, condo roads and maybe wanting to do something on that an hour later. We talked tonight a bit about um, there was another item, oh, uh, uh, parking potentially for a future year. After a meeting like this, we would start to distill those into potential future years work that we'd then be bringing forward in the budgeting process, for example. Uh, we're all learning about capacity. Uh, this is our uh, maybe our second full year or so getting through the operational plan. And uh, we want to make sure that we don't just, as staff, don't just say yes to everything that is asked and then disappoint later. We want council and staff leaders to have the information to make educated decisions, especially as uh, priorities emerge in year as well. Uh, so that's enough introduction to the actual progress report. So quarter one is uh, uh, January, February, March, and then we usually spend the, the month after the quarter assembling the information. Uh, so this is um, a May, and uh, we're into the Q1 progress report. We had 37 items completed. And uh, in Appendix B, um, which everyone can find online, it lists all of those items that were completed in, uh, in quarter one. And we have a few projects, significant projects nearing completion. And we had a few items adjusted out of Q1 into the second quarter of the year. Uh, most of those are reaching maturity. Uh, they're on the slide here, but a few are of them are the community risk assessment, which is a fire risk assessment required by regulation. Uh, the corporate vehicle use policy review, which is very close to completion. Uh, the Grain Terminals Redevelopment Phase 5 Memorandum of Understanding Negotiations, uh, which as the mayor reported back to the public uh, quite recently um, after a rise from in camera, uh, we're planning to bring back to council um, in early June. Uh, the Short-Term Accommodation and the Social Media Policy Update and the Youth Engagement Working Group Report Back. In fact, we're on the agenda uh, earlier today. And uh, we also have a taxi licensing and ride sharing pol policy update uh, that's being developed uh, under the leadership of the clerks uh, and bylaw areas um, that will be coming forward. In your report as well, you will see that there are, is an Appendix C, and that includes all of the work on the operational plan that's currently slated through the remainder of the year in future quarters and notes the sources and, and um, uh, which quarter it's currently uh, tracking toward. And um, there are 270 items in queue to, to achieve through the rest of the year. So uh, we're hoping that we will, we will get through all of those. And if not, we'll have made a heads up um, intelligent decisions based on councils and staff priorities, uh, depending on uh, the type of work uh, in what we do. Uh, there's something that we suggested at the, uh, in setting the, uh, next slide, please. The deputy clerk is very good at knowing when to change the slides. Um, the one thing that we uh, we had given uh, council a, um, a heads up that we wanted to do is that there are a number of previous council resolutions uh, that we felt either should be uh, combined with other work that's already moving forward and is part of the plan or potentially um, um, uh, repealed, uh, ended. And uh, the, these are noted on this slide. They are all shown in Appendix A. Uh, so all everything shown uh, 1 to 11, except number 6, would simply be incorporated in other work. And number 6, there was a proposal that the, um, 
uh, there was a Committee of Adjustment Property Standards Review, which was looking at potentially um, moving those accountabilities into council instead of a separate committee that we were suggesting um, we could probably uh, request that council um, not proceed with that work at this time, given that we've just set a new, uh, a new committee and they seem to be working well. And the, uh, the workload to bring that in, uh, fully into council would be quite substantial for the members. Um, and then I just look to the clerk, but with this, because these were uh, council resolutions that were resolved by a previous council, instead of, uh, if you had resolved these yourselves, you would, would have required a two thirds vote to change them. But because they're from a previous council, a simple majority uh, would enable you to provide us with an alternate direction. The next slide, uh, the key, a number of key council goals were identified and uh, just briefly, uh, council's intended to be well informed and that's ongoing and we try to uh, improve that all the time. Uh, citizen satisfaction uh, needs to be continued and baselined. Uh, one of the things that we're doing there is issuing an RFQ, request for quotation for a community survey. And uh, we've also uh, been unveiling uh, some new work uh, by the um, Customer and Corporate Services Department on a, uh, a more support, software supports for customer service and new processes to acknowledge and track uh, requests. Uh, the, the unaffordable housing side, we have the rapid ADU um, work uh, well underway uh, and on track and the master plan in progress. Uh, you heard earlier today about it being uh, proceeding to uh, uh, the various steps of public consultation and consultation with developers in short order. Um, there was uh, in number five here, uh, we were required to de demonstrate action on updating our land use planning policy and re regulatory instruments. Uh, so the up official plan update has been somewhat paused, or at least the date that we can come back to council has been pushed out because the province made some very substantial changes to what was the called the now called the provincial planning statement. Um, that doesn't mean work has stopped. We're certainly working as fast or faster than ever, but we just want to make sure that we don't uh, roll out a proposed changes changes to the official plan that now will be uh, not in line with the provincial direction for such uh, such documents. And we have uh, awarded our fees and processes review that will cover development. So that's going to go uh, through the. Uh, planning division, uh, the building division, and as well as the engineering division and all the steps uh, that it takes to get the various planning applications uh, through the processes and look at uh, if these can be streamlined as well as if we're, we've right-sized the fees and made sure that we have the right resources on board uh, so that these can proceed in a timely fashion in Collingwood. Uh, we've kicked off uh, a very soft kickoff uh, with uh, council, uh, the uh, str uh, strategic plan renewal, and we'll have the consultant RFQ or RFP out shortly uh, to get some additional support for that. And council has received the Art Center Phase 2 report, so that's done. And uh, we're now in uh, developing the Phase 3 planning. That is underway at the Parks, Recreation and Culture uh, Division uh, Department. And uh, we'll be coming back to Council for their endorsement, for your endorsement. And as well, there's an appendix provided, Appendix D uh, attached to the report, uh, because one of the things we wanted to do was very explicitly track the high priorities uh, for the town. And those are set out in a summer, uh, shorter appendix. If you didn't want to read all 270 that are left, you can read through the high priorities and maybe see uh, the status on many of the items uh, that are of most interest to the community. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, pr uh, bringing these, uh, we intend to anyway, continue bringing these reports unless council gives us other direction. Uh, so we have the next status report coming in in September. And um, generally after each council meeting, when you give us direction, we'll update the operational plan. Although uh, ideally most of the work is set out at the beginning of year of the year. And in concert with this, you'll see we also have the financial report that comes forward quarterly. So that's on your agenda tonight. That includes operating capital projects, staff salaries, and grant application updates. 
And uh, each uh, quarter, we also, if there are any things that are appropriate for the municipal act to be in camera, we'll, ha we'll list those separately as uh, somewhat state of the corporation updates, uh, which you could expect uh, later in this month as well. And with that, that is our quarterly update on the key work that's progressed. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, is there anyone from the public that would wish, I don't have anyone in the gallery here, but who would wish to have comment on this? Okay, so seeing that, just for clarification, uh, before we uh, look at the motion, CEO Skinner, uh, the question had come up earlier today regarding the 11 proposed, had it been worried, worded cancelled, but it appeared from the chart that they had been referred into another process and weren't really being cancelled, they were simply being uh, taken up in another area. Is that yes. correct? Yes, to the chair. That is entirely the intent. We would be open to rewording that if just to make it more clear that the work had been moved into existing, consolidated with existing projects um, that are in other places in the operational plan. And so just to confirm, I think number 11 would actually be a cancellation. But that was the Domo May. The no Mo May initiative was that number eleven or no? That's a different list. The, the committee of adjustments of oh. item item. Right. Uh, I think was the one that we were suggesting could be a cancellation pending uh, uh, the committee's mm -hmm. endorsement. All right. So just bef before again, I do this motion because we may require um, some amendments. The other one was uh, the committee of adjustment um, had come up in the previous council as um, there had appeared to be uh, a non-alignment between council's strategic plan and vision and a decision at the C of A. So I think the difficulty here tonight will be that we believe that that motion was for council to take over the entire process. And I think maybe what we might want to propose for this evening is having an understanding as to how to integrate uh, an understanding of council's vision and strategic plan with the C of A decisions, which would be something totally different than what was proposed there. So with that, we will start with um, the motion uh, that staff report CAO 2023-06, the 2023 operational plan uh, quarter one progress report be received. Could I have a mover and a seconder? We'll just do that right now. Uh, Councillor Baines and Councillor Ring and all those in favor. And that is carried unanimously. All right. So for the second part of that, um, the motion currently read as uh, distributed was and that council direct staff to change the status to counseled, canceled for the 11 items outlined in Appendix A. Is there any amendments uh, proposed with respect to reflect the information in the chart. Vice Chair. Just, is there another way to describe them as opposed, I mean, they have been kind of redirected or refocused. Um, just, I, the word canceled just strikes me as very unilateral. Yeah. And I, yeah, the wording I had in mind was maybe uh, referred per the chart provided, or yeah. the appendix provided. It's already listed throughout the whole chart, with the exception of uh, the C of A one, which we may have to become something different. Or even that can be referred based on the comments that mm -hmm. you just made. Mm -hmm. That you know, Other than it's a totally different ask, so I would expect to maybe bring up the different ask under other business, and maybe that would be the only one that would be cancelled, was the ask for all of council to take over the uh, C of A function. So we would be canceling that one and referring all the balance per the appendix as outlined. Is that a reasonable wording? Yep. Clerk Thomas. Thank you, Chair Jeffrey. So the one question I have is, is by carrying on with the word cancel, like what happens if we add to the, the, uh, the end of the motion that they be canceled understanding uh the matters have been identified as part of other items within the work plan just because if we just say it's being referred then really the, what we're what we do when we're posting the that operational plan is after a council meeting we actually copy and paste and that motion goes into the operational plan so if we're saying they're not technically canceled Strong. i don't think we could de delete that that's um, 
I, well, I'm just worried about if we cancel them, how do you refer them somewhere else? Yeah, Skinner? I think, you know, potentially the definitions are, you were talking, working with two different definitions. In the um, database that we currently use, the way that we, we only have set up currently at the staff side a few different types of status that we have. We have on, on hold, you know, completed um, in progress. And canceled would um, just allow us to mark them as canceled. Uh, so I do actually like the approach that uh, uh, the clerk has mentioned, and I'll just be specific on the wording. It's changing the status of the task to canceled and moving the actionable con content to... Um, C combining the, the actionable content with other existing uh, tasks. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor? I wanted to ask specifically about item five, which is the one in regards to um, the council direct staff to investigate and report back regarding the ability to use the minister's zoning order to expedite the potential location of affordable housing. Um, we know specifically the minister removed affordable housing from that name. So my question through the chair um, or to the chair is um, if some wording isn't applicable, and this goes right back to our early discussion about seeing the word affordable housing and, and uh, assuming that we're working on it, we don't have the ability to work on it uh, the way this reads. So is that an item you bring up later or... That motion from the previous council, and I only know because it was mine, <laughs> is that um, the um, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was bragging about the number of units that had onboarded uh, using MZOs for long-term health care. So what had tweaked my interest at that time, if they were able to accomplish that many uh, units for long-term health care, why couldn't we be using it uh, to help? Um, improve um, our ability to turn over for affordable housing. Um, so I think that that would go into other processes as well in terms of our planning and things. But it was just another tool. But we, we now we know we have Chia, we have some other things being onboarded that we would hopefully be able to. So I would look to Director Valentine for that. But I'm sure that it doesn't have to be dropped. I just think it was the potential of the tool to help us the way it had helped long-term health care. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly looking at MZOs and CHIAs as a tool to achieve affordable housing is possible, um, depending on what commitments we would be able to um, have from the developers. And the CHIA tool is much easier than um, an MZO because that does uh, allow municipalities to enter into an agreement um, with the, the the landowner and the and the province to play a part in that. So I would suggest, as noted in the report, that combining that request with the affordable housing um, master plan, which we have on the go, and specifically indicating to the consultant that if there's any way to use those tools um, in combination with incentives or other available um, prongs that they might suggest uh, would be an appropriate path forward. Okay. I'm fine with that. If it's, it's something, as you say, it's into, into the process yeah. of, of being yeah. dealt with. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. So I have a mover and a seconder for the wording as originally proposed in the, um, and I think that we hear an amendment from the CAO that would allow us to show the, the status is canceled, but that it's going to just to add here and referred per the chart is that That's yeah. morning. oh thank you clerk almost has some morning certainly so an amendment could be the addition of the following to the end of that uh line after appendix a include as the actionable matters have been combined with other existing tasks in the operational plan with the exception that the committee of adjustment being a committee of council be cancelled mm -hmm. yeah. she's so awesome Okay, so I have a mover and a seconder for the amendment, please. Councillor Baines, Vice Chair Doherty, any comments specific to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor? And any comments to the motion as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amended motion. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Baines. 
Can I just make a comment and perhaps a question to the CAO? Um, uh, it's illuminating, educating, and shocking to see so many items on this mm -hmm. list, I must say. I agree with the high priorities. I agree with the low priorities. It's the mushy medium priorities that concern me for, I suppose, all of us. And particularly when we want to come up with new ones, like, for instance, a proactive approach in regard to our dealings with condominiums or uh, the road uh, parking issue, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, uh, perhaps it's a, a, a senseless question, but is there anything here in the medium that can perhaps be moved down to low? Because I just, uh, I'm worried about staff and their time and their efforts and all this that... Uh, perhaps given more direction that we could clear the decks a bit for of some of these mediums? I think if I could speak, I think the strategic plan will assist us with that. And I also think that staff is very good at uh, bringing to us the order of the priorities as they have to shift them around to respond to what is happening currently. And then I'll let the CEO add to that if she needs to. Thank you uh, uh, to the chair and through the chair. Uh, I, I do agree uh, that it is difficult to juggle our priorities. And you'll often hear staff say when uh, council brings something forward, <laughs> condo roads or, or something else, we'll, uh, we'll try to combine it with some work that's already happening. And there's some key things like the official plan that uh, we've combined quite a lot of important work into. Um, it is always very helpful to staff if, um, for example, if there's a notice of motion where a council member has seen something that they think needs some action, um, in most cases, if you ask us for, you know, a staff report on the best way to tackle it, for example, um, if you're working with, uh, you know, 10 or 15 key items and you're trying to figure out the right, right order, it, uh, it's still a challenge. But you, once you put it into 270 items, um, when we uh, move that orchestra around, it sort of behooves us to think uh, very hard about what your priorities are and, and which order you'd like to see them. Uh, so we haven't asked staff uh, recently if there's anything in the, um, it's our new term, the mushy middle, the, the medium <laughs> priorities that we'd like to push off until the next year. But uh, each quarter um, I do meet with, uh, and the department heads lead for their departments, a uh, just a discussion about what's coming up and what makes sense uh, so that we're able to make sure that we don't spend too much time in those medium priorities and miss the real things that council's finding, you know, very important or very important for staff, you know, efficiency and delivery. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Mayor. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask a question about one specific one in Appendix C? Sure. Um, the one that I was looking at is on page 26. It's at item 35. And it refers to the asset management plan phase two, all assets, which we know is in, is in progress as is noted. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, because I looked through and I could not find, and it may be somewhere here, a very, very extensive list and, and such, but um, I, I was anticipating a report on the reserve situation um, because I do anticipate uh, wanting to come back and, and speak to the, uh, the surplus allocation policy. Um, would the reserve report be part of the asset plan report because it does link together very, um, can I ask that through you to? Uh, the treasurer. Treasurer. If I may, your worship, or pardon me, Madam Chair, um, through you to the deputy mayor. Not part of the AMP report, but certainly part of our annual financial statements, which will be coming forward in June, will include some information around reserves. That being said, um, the AMP report will be coming in June as well. So the, the two will align at a pretty good timing because we'll need to understand that too to give a good sort of overview of where we will be or what we need to be in terms of life cycle management and things like that. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, because that was the other thing I was trying to think about prepping for the uh, 2022 financial statements. So it all part of that report. That's great. Okay, good. CEO Skinner. Just briefly, because this is the first time we've been through this. Um, the uh, We do also have, and it's quite new in the process, the agenda management that projects out three months, the types of reports that you can expect to see. Uh, not all the reports will end up on this uh, uh, operational plan because some of them are simply routine ongoing work 
and um, and not not a project. So you might need to look at those two in concert with each other, so that you're well educated and the public is well educated on what will be coming to your table soon. I was just going to say the uh, clerk almost had pointed me in direction of that report that it was out now, and I've actually shared that probably half a dozen times with people that have been uh, um, have asked me a question of this and a question of that. So I think it's a great tool for our use, for our own personal use, but also for easily directing somebody to uh, to, to to look and see when they can anticipate something. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, treasurer's report. Is it critical, Vice Chair? Can you do it under other business? Uh, not really. It was just a really super quick question. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to the uh, Create an HR Services Master Plan, item 61 in Appendix C, and it's noted as being new ad hoc, and I'm just wondering what that uh, sort of referred to. Um Actually, I'm not uh, through the chair. Uh, I'm not sure what new ad hoc is. We have new um, um, uh, department-initiated projects. I just see, yeah. I'm just quoting from the um, implementation planning column. We'd have to follow up on that one for you. We okay. will. Yeah, yeah, they'll get back to you. Okay. All right. So that's going to get us to 6.5. And we'll be pleased to hear from Treasurer Quinlan on the quarter one financial mm. report, which uh, we had a very succinct report circulated to us. And thank you for that. So the floor is yours, Treasurer Quinlan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Um, we do try and follow. This is the first time you're seeing it, but we do um, try and follow the CAO's um, delivery of the quarter one sort of performance uh, indicators, I guess, at the end of the day, the things that we do, the work that we create or, or in the capital that we purchase and all the things that are included in that long list of projects cost money, and, and it gives us a good time to sort of piggyback on each other and share sort of here's what we've done and then of course where the financial situation is for the town. So this will occur for each quarter. Um, you did see the quarter four report um, as a, a, a preemptive sort of uh, position on the year end uh, situation. Um, but certainly you'll see throughout the year um, the remaining quarters as we as we move throughout the year. Um, we have tried or have incorporated uh, some additional information that's new for this year in comparison to last year, and that was with respect to um, a request from Councillor uh, Jeffries during the budget, uh, uh, 2023 budget, I should say. So we do include uh, salaries and benefits information as well. Um, we also uh, walk through the operating and capital budget, of course, as that's the um, the, the whole uh, piece of information. And our final portion of this report includes a, a grant uh, status report so that um, uh, members of council can see uh, where we're at with respect to funding opportunities that are available, how many we've gone after, um, lots of reporting to follow up with the applications that we complete, and of course, anything that we've been successful or um, been rejected for. So it's a it's a succinct little uh, piece of information at the end of the uh, report. We feel as staff that uh, the financials provide council with a review of actual versus budget and allows them to make the important uh, decisions that uh, they need to throughout the year and giving you uh, an update and sort of an overview. Um, and in some cases, uh, there may be times where there's requests for additional or uh, changes to the budget. This is the uh, mechanism we would use. From an operational standpoint, we've progressed through the first quarter um, as we would expect. Um, there continues to be some lasting pressures from the pandemic, pandemic excuse me, largely supply chain issues and timing of, of deliveries um, that we've seen throughout uh, 2022, but it seems to carry on into 2023. We still as staff believe that the current operating budget mitigates these impacts. And as we see things um, arise, of course, we'll keep council abreast of those situations. Um, it isn't. Uh, it is expected, essentially, that at this time of year we will be in a surplus position, which is exactly where we're at. 
Uh, in January, for all of us, uh, we received our, our first tax bill or the interim tax bill, which represents 50% of the taxes that um, were charged in 2022. That is the first bill that happens. The second billing happens in June. Um, so we would expect that when we're um, issuing out 50% of the taxes that we would hold a surplus at this point in the year, and we, we certainly do. Expenses for the tax-supported divisions at this point are at 22.3% of the budget, which is slightly below uh, the 25% expectation, and it's largely just due to the timing of expenditures. Um, moving <clears throat> through the capital program at this point can be a little bit slower. Um, quarter two and quarter three, we expect uh, a lot more movement. So you'll see that the capital um, information is fairly short. <laughs> There's really not a lot to report outside of the fact that we are moving along with the design for the newly expanded water treatment plant, and, and that represents about 90% of the funds that have been spent so far this year. Uh, with respect to the salaries, there is a slight variable uh, position at 23.6%. Again, we would expect being 25% through the year that that would be um, around 25%. And it's largely due to the fact that there's the seasonality, seasonality of hiring for our summer students and our summer staff. Um, there are a few vacancies at this point, as well as um, some new staff that were budgeted for 2023 that will um, come into uh, play in the second quarter. Um, and finally, from a grant perspective for the first quarter, we have received um, just over two and a half million dollars of funding approvals, and we have 13 applications in process. And I think that about sums it up for uh, quarter one. Excellent summary. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public uh, who, no, no one left? Okay, all right. Uh, so the motion is that um, uh, staff report T-2023-11, 2023 quarter one financial <coughs> report be received for information. If I could have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Ring, Deputy Mayor. Any questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And I actually have a number of questions, but I'm very cognizant of the time and we still have further business. And I didn't have a chance to check with Treasurer Quinlan in advance. So I plan on just taking them offline and uh, and I'll provide an email to Finance and Council in that regard. But the one thing I wanted to ask about was um, some of my specific questions um, are, is because I went back and looked at 2022's report because I wanted to see what variances um, there were between actuals for the first quarter of this year compared to last year. And I just would make the request um, that it uh, be considered um, maybe for uh, the quarter two report. And I'll leave that up to staff to decide um, if, uh, if that report could be expanded to include actuals for the previous year. And, uh, and I just, found that helpful to look at how the operations were in the first quarter um, compared to uh, last year as well. So, All right. So, um, Treasurer Quinlan, is that a hardship? Is it possible? Sorry, I couldn't get my mic on. No, I think I think that's a reasonable um, expectation. We're happy to include it. Okay. For sure. Thank you Thank for you. that. Okay, great. All right. So, seeing no other questions, all those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. All right. Uh, number seven, departmental updates. We have one, 7.1. If Manager Cubit has been so patient to wait for this part of the meeting, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Thank you, Chair Jeffrey, members of the committee. Um, so this update is just to help close the loop on direction provided by Canada regarding fireworks um, discussed earlier this year. So you will recall that in February, staff report PRC 2023-01 regarding this year's Canada Day fireworks was presented to council and the resolution uh, resulting from that report was to proceed with traditional fireworks subject to the successful results of a fireworks display service provider RFP and that should the fireworks RFP be unsuccessful, council reallocates the funds for the fireworks to expand other activities in celebration of Canada Day as suggested in the community feedback responses. And these were responses collected between November and December of 2022 via Engage Collingwood. 
So following the guidance and policies of our procurement office, the fireworks service provider RFP went to the open market on March 23rd and it closed April 13th. There were two bid takers, um, but ultimately no bids received. So therefore there will be no Canada Day fireworks. Um, as approved by council, staff will be redirecting the fireworks funds towards alternative Canada Day activities. And a review of the feedback from the fireworks survey shows more live music as the most popular requested alternative. So staff um, have discussed this and coordinated with the Collingwood Downtown BIA with whom we traditionally collaborate on the Collingwood Festival for Canada. And we're working on a mini music crawl of sorts of local and regional artists performing at multiple outdoor locations in the downtown core on July 1st. We will also be hosting an evening concert at the Shipyards Amphitheater on July 1st, featuring the band Coming of Age and Spencer McKenzie. And that is generously sponsored by Fram Slocker and Collingwood Key Condos. Now we did discuss a drone show as an alternative to traditional fireworks in our um, original report. And just wanted to note tonight that the postponed BIA drone show is not an option for Canada Day as the operators are already booked elsewhere. Instead, we're happy to announce that that show is going to be added to this year's Side Launch Days Festival happening um, August 12th and 13th. The drone show will be taking place um, on the evening of Saturday, August 12th, and those details will be confirmed. And we just want to again, thank the BIA for this contribution. And lastly, plans for Canada Day 2024 fireworks or fireworks alternatives will be addressed later in the year. Um, we expect leading up to or during the budget process. And that's my update. Any questions? Thank you very much, Manager Cubitt. Are there any questions? Not seeing any. So thank you very much for the update and enjoy the balance of your evening. Thank you so much. Uh, number eight. <clears throat> is uh, minutes of uh, is reports and minutes of other committees and boards and we have two this evening and um, so I will read the recommendation uh, that the minutes of the following committees and boards be hereby received and recommendations contained therein be approved um, uh, the Collingwood Downtown BIA Board of Management minutes April 13th and the recommendation is that the BIA Board of Management request consideration to amend the business licensing bylaw to permit food trucks to operate on private property within the BIA with the consent of the business and property owner that would be impacted by the food truck. And uh, Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee minutes of April 13, 2023. So if I could have a mover and a seconder for everything, I'm going to ask to sever uh, Councillor Perry and Councillor Houston. Um, so what I'd like to do is sever out uh, strictly the approval of the minutes of the BIA Board of Management without the recommendation and the minutes of the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee uh, with, uh, they had no recommendations in any event. So um, all those in favor of the minutes only. All those in favor, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, that was just the BIA minutes. And the Trails and Advisory minutes. Can I just ask a quick question about trails? Yeah. I, 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 and I'm still supportive of them. Um, it mentions in uh, within the uh, report about um, <clears throat> the trails committee speaking with town staff in regards to using the um, the town booth at the uh, farmers market in June in conjunction with the uh, climate action team and their um, their work on uh, bike month of June. So I just wondered if if that has happened um, just because the the minutes were back in April, um, if, if that's moving along and, and if there even is a date known as to um, when they will be using ours. I know the library talked about using it June the 17th. So I, I just wondered if, um, if there was any update I'm not sure there's someone here who can give you that specific. I can yes. come later. But if they, oh, Director Slama? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Deputy Mayor Fryer, uh, that has been arranged. I was just trying to quickly look up the date, uh, but uh, they are going um, to the uh, the farmer's market booth. Yeah, okay. in coordination with That's the great. C CCAT. 
Thank you for that uh, response. Okay, so uh, what was severed out was the uh, consideration of the BIA recommendation with respect to um, food trucks and um, in a discussion earlier today and the wisdom of receiving um, a broader public or making it available for broader public input with respect to the impact uh, in the downtown core. Um, there is some question about referring it uh, to staff if there were such an amendment to allow for a circulation, a broader circulation for the next committee of the whole meeting so that a council could be an assured um, of the discussion that has occurred with respect to this recommendation. That motion. Okay, you'd thank like you, to Deputy Mayor. And is there a seconder for the referral? Um, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And the clerk's going to speak. Certainly, yeah. Thank you, Chair Jeffrey. We do um, support the deferral, regardless any changes to the business licensing bylaw and the operation of food trucks does require public notice. But there is a little bit of confusion on um, the original recommendation to prohibit food trucks in the downtown actually came from the BIA and the BIA making this re uh, resolution and, and us not being able to consult with the other restaurant owners to uh, get their support. Uh, we would be supportive of at least making sure that they were aware when it was coming back. I would would suggest maybe don't identify necessarily for the for a meeting in June. If we say a meeting in June, okay. maybe not the next one will, uh, because it, it'll depend with our notice requirements too, which I think is three weeks. So it possibly could be the other one, but we're supportive of making sure they're they're aware. And if they want to come to council, they can communicate it directly to council members. All right. So um, the wording should be to refer to staff and defer to a meeting in June. Yeah. Okay. So. We're okay with that wording? Okay. All right. No other discussion. All those in favor of that? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Oh, CEO Skinner. At the end of that mm -hmm. item, yeah. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that the communications has forwarded in response to the Deputy Mayor's question uh, that the Trails Committee has a booth at the Farmer's Market on June 3rd on Trails Day. And uh, that the uh, community climate action team was, uh, I believe, getting their own another booth. Thank you. Well, now I know I won't be here, and <laughs> I made a promise I would be at that. So that's why I was asking, that. <laughs> and then that's totally fine. Yeah. All right. That's great. So we have nothing this evening for item nine for the consent agenda, which brings us to other business. Uh, I believe under other business, and I'm not sure if staff need anything further or the clerk requires anything further, but a couple of major items that came out of discussion was the development of rules regarding private roads, which could be referred to the OP process. And I'm not sure you need a, a motion for us to do that, or we've asked for it and staff have taken it under consideration. Um. I think that this is a major change, like the, the part of um, uh, private roads not uh, linking to other private roads. I think that we've put that in the draft OP already. Um, as far as other considerations are, are, are more broad, uh, I think that understanding exactly what's desired and, and how quickly council would desire it to be to happen would be would be helpful. So then the mayor could bring in notice of motion to... F yeah, that's know, exactly the note I made to myself. I'll, okay. I'll put together a notice of motion. All right, yeah. that's great. All right, and then with respect to... There was another one here for us. Um, parking uh, for 2024. Um, is there someone who would like to do it? If not, I will do a notice of motion at some point um, with respect to that. Councillor Baines, are you interested? No? Uh, yes, I... Okay. All right. We'll watch for that. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to delegate, did you? All right. And then Councillor Baines also had another item that he wanted to ask through staff under other business with respect to the SCAP and SDUs uh, as they were applied to um, the... Um... Actually, not quite that. No, it's more the um, short-term accommodation. Yes. That's what I was trying to look for, SDAs. And, so, yeah, take and, it away. My concern is linking the newly desired and wanted by this council accessory dwelling units to the um, short-term accommodation. Uh, I'm opposed to this in principle, and I just want to put it on the table because we're going to work so hard to bring more affordable housing to this town. And if it immediately gets assigned over to short-term accommodation, to me, it just doesn't seem consistent to what 
we are looking for uh, as a council and as a town. So I, I think this, I, I need to be convinced of this, and I put it over to Director Valentine for response as to how we reconcile this, because I, I just am not prepared to surrender it to a short-term accommodation right off the get-go. I, I, I think it sends the wrong message, so. Clerk Almas would uh, like to respond first. Like that. Certainly. It's my understanding there are two completely different concepts. Short-term accommodation is only responsible for rentals that are 30 days and less. So the accessory dwelling unit program is for a longer-term rental program. Is that correct? But I thought we read, with great respect in here, that uh, an owner could use their accessory dwelling unit and rent it out as a short-term accommodation. Am I... Either the principal residence or the accessory door. Yes. But it falls. Oh. Yes. Hey, Director Valentine, go ahead. And then Council Ring has a question with respect. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the clerk. Um, so with respect to landowners who are applying for the town's grant through the Rapid ADU program in order to uh, assist with the cost of developing ADU, um, you might recall that there's a two-stage grant process. So the first grant um, for eligibility would require the owner to enter into an agreement or memorandum of understanding with the town that they would be renting that new ADU full-time year-round for at least five years. So that's the first protection. If they are going for grant two, which is essentially piggybacking on the County of Simcoe's financial incentives, the county requires them to uh, maintain that unit as a year-round rental uh, for 15 years at an affordable price. So those are a couple of safeguards for new ADUs that come through our rapid deployment program. Those that don't though, I hear the councillor's uh, concern and part of the way that I understand um, the team has addressed uh, those, those concerns is one capping the number of licenses that would be available to 200. And the other piece that has been, you know, adding to, of course, complexity and balance around this uh, particular topic is that through consultation, we did also hear that folks are using uh, short-term rentals to supplement their income, which helps them stay in their home and afford the rising cost of mortgages and insurance and that type of thing. So again, there was a balance because ADUs, a family having an ADU available could help them stay in their home and help with affordability. So uh, whether we've hit that balance right, um, public consultation is part of, of the next steps and certainly in evolving discussion with council. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, is there anyone online uh, for public delegations? All right, seeing none, that takes us right to... Chair. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, um, I thought that there would be uh, one other notice of motion for the request for staff report to consider mechanisms whereby the Committee of Adjustment could become more educated and or aligned with the community-based strategic plan. Perfect. So you're taking that on? I'm taking that one. Perfect. Notice of motion. Excellent. All right. So I'm looking one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Who, yeah, really. All right, a motion to adjourn. Oh, Councillor Potts missed it. Councillor Houston, you've got it. He uh, missed his card. He tried to grab it. Thank you very much, everyone. A lot, of, lot done tonight. Uh,